Good morning to all of you, and thanks for coming this morning. Welcome to this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. We have one item on our agenda this morning. This is our annual public hearing on the Commission's agenda and priorities for the next fiscal year. Sorry, for the next two fiscal years. I always say that CPSC's mission is aided by the input and the insight of all of our stakeholders. And I am grateful today to today's presenters as well as to those who have submitted written testimony for taking the time and the effort to share your thoughts as well as your expertise. Your input is invaluable to this commission. Presenters have been divided into four panels. Each presenter will have 10 minutes to deliver their comments. Our secretary, Ms. Alberta Mills, will keep track of the time. Thanks to Ms. Mills, Ms. Hammonds, and the Office of Secretary for all of their assistance today. Presenters, I would ask you to watch the light in front of you to track your remaining time. When the yellow light comes on, it indicates that you have one minute left for uh, your comments. In addition, the Office of the General Counsel is here to ensure we remain on track and within the boundaries of our hearing. Throughout the day, we will be joined by Ms. Patricia Hands, General Counsel, and Ms. Melissa Hampshire, Assistant General Counsel. Ms. Hands will be recused from panels one and three. Following all of the presenters, uh, panelists' presentations, commissioners will have 10 minutes for, uh, for questions. Given time considerations, we will have just one round of commission questions per panel, which all of the offices have discussed ahead of time. After our second panel, around 1.05 p.m., we will break for an hour for lunch. Out of respect for all of our panelists, I want to make every effort to stay on time so everyone can meet whatever obligations they may have today. I apologize ahead of time if I have to gavel down either one of our panelists or my colleagues, but I do want to be cognizant of, of people's time. We will keep the record open for one week after today's hearing. If you do not get a chance to say something you really would like to have into the record, you have an additional week to uh, comment and add your comments or your thoughts. You are welcome to supplement whatever testimony you have provided or comment further in writing. We are happy to receive that and will, of course, review it. With that, we will uh, begin with our first panel this morning, which includes Nancy Coles from Kids in Danger, Dr. Diana Zuckerberg from the National Center for Health Research, Zuckerman, I apologize. <clears throat> Bob is right here. He keeps me on my toes. Um, I apologize. These are out of order, but it's Ms. Nan Nancy Coles, Ms. Janet McGee, Dr. Diana Zuckerman, Greg Wiestadt, and Pamela Zederich. Zederich. Okay. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here, and with that, I'll ask Ms. Coles to begin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present comments on the agenda and priorities for the coming fiscal year. We take this uh, opportunity very seriously and hope that you uh, hear things today that will help you determine the, the course of the agency. Uh, as you know, KID is dedicated to protecting children by fighting for product safety. Our mission is to save lives by enhancing transparency and accountability through safer product development, better education, and stronger advocacy for children. We have been presenting testimony at these hearings for many years, longer than you all have been here to hear it. So <laughs> I'll reiterate some of the same issues I've raised in past years. But my key message from KID today is to think about innovation, regulation, and transparency. Through the implementation of the CPSIA and Danny's Law, the CPSC has successfully developed strong mandatory standards for 19 types of durable infant and toddler products, leaving just six items uh, from the original list remaining. But 2018 is the 10th anniversary of Danny's Law, meaning that a decade after passage of this landmark legislation, consumers still have no assurance that those six products, to say nothing about products that aren't covered by a standard, um, such as baby nests, crib hammocks, and other potentially hazardous products, not even covered by voluntary standards, are safe for their children. Please continue to prioritize this work, giving staff the time, resources, and support that they need to develop strong standards. In addition, we think that CPSC should include in Section 104 rulemaking 
all durable infant and toddler products. Parents should have the confidence that all nursery products, not just those that were made at the time the original law was passed, are safe with a strong standard. Despite the strong recommendation from the AAP, who you'll hear from, against using crib bumper pads, a position echoed by virtually all health and safety organizations, CPSC is working with ASTM to create a standard. The current work focuses on the firmness of the bumper, trying to make them firmer, even though we believe that might introduce additional problems, such as wedging of the baby between the bumper and the um, side of the crib. The amount of time and money going into designing a possible test method for these unnecessary products would be better spent joining Maryland, Ohio, the city of Chicago, and virtually every child care regulator in the country to ban the use of padded bumpers. A standard that doesn't address the risk and gives a false sense of safety to parents is more dangerous than no standard. Danny's Law also requires the use of prepaid product registration cards. We all know that direct notification is the best way to inform parents about a recall. Um, and while the card and online site are at a minimum requirement, we believe that companies should be encouraged to innovate and add other methods such as scanning an icon or barcode or partnering with technology companies on different ideas. The CPSC should also research registration numbers, return ratios, and recall impact from the use of the cards and publish those findings. Saferproducts.gov. Um, according to recent data that we got from CPSC, there have been over 35,000 reports made to Safer Products. Information we got last year shows that an average of 800,000 visitors each year use the site. It's an invaluable resource for safety, and it's discouraging but not surprising that when we look at those numbers, the number of the reports has dropped every year since 2012. There appears to be little effort to publicize the database. Company comments on the site discourage the use of the database and instead tell uh, consumers that they would get better results if they reported it directly to the company where it would not be made public. CPSC should prioritize using low-cost efforts to increase the database's visibility and use as presented in the 2016 report by the Consumer Federation of America and add additional types of reports to the public database that currently are not included. Uh, SaferProducts.gov was a compromise, really. What we really wanted to see was the elimination of Section 6B of the Consumer Product Safety Act that hides safety information from consumers. We still think that that's the best direction to go. Parents should not have to wait until a recall is complete before learning their child is sleeping in a deadly crib, playing with a lead-tainted toy, or riding in a stroller prone to losing a wheel. Our recent recall report where we looked at 2016 for recall effectiveness um, shows, well, Nothing, because the data simply could not be used. Um, because of the overuse of Section 6B protection, many of the reports we received were basically blank. Every drop of information redacted, including already public information, such as whether they had paste, posted on Facebook and how many products were in the original recall, which is in your, your press release. The redactions are on top of other reports that have missing months or data fields, mathematical errors, or are simply never filed. We urge the CPSC to require companies to comply with CPSA, including Section 6B, by not allowing it to become a blanket protection for any public accountability. A lot of work goes into announcing a recall. However, we must stop thinking that is the goal. Removing unsafe products from consumer use is the goal. Innovation is needed in recall effectiveness. From what we can gather from SPART's data, the effectiveness rate has not changed significantly since we first started working on this issue when Danny died in 1998, despite mind-boggling changes in communication channels and tracking possibilities. The burden falls on consumers, listen to the news, fill out forms, wait for and install repairs, but consumers are not the one responsible for recalled products. This imbalance of burden and responsibility should be corrected. We were very pleased to see the recent release of recall effectiveness numbers from the monthly reports for a very limited number of recalls from the beginning of this year, and equally disappointed to see it disappear this week. Hopefully that's not permanent. We know it took a lot of time and perseverance to get us to this point, and I believe it's going to be very useful going forward in measuring and improving recalls. We look forward to following the development of this data set.
We also applaud CPSC action to begin the mandatory recall process on the Britix Bob branded strollers that have been involved in dozens of injuries. This is one of the tools in CPSC's arsenal to protect consumers that is used too rarely. While it might not lead to a recall as quickly as we might like, it does give consumers information now that they can use to protect their families. In terms of safe sleep, which I know I talk about every year, and I, I just want to add that I think we are seeing a lot of products still come on the market that are unsafe. And so in addition to standards works, I think CPSC needs to make it a priority within the small business ombudsman's office to provide outreach and product safety information to the companies that are entering this pro these products into the market. Uh, you'll hear more about furniture shortly, but I just want to you know, briefly say um, what we think CPSC should focus on in the next two years when it comes to furniture tip overs. We want to see continued CPSC participation and leadership in the ASTM committee to push for a stronger standard, including an increase of testing weight to 60 pounds and a testing surface to mimic the carpeting in most bedrooms. We want to see recalls of products that do not meet the ASTM standards. There's absolutely no reason they should still be in the marketplace. Strong education messages for furniture that's already in home to be anchored, and with that, an evaluation of the Anchor It campaign to see if we can measure changes in behavior and use the, two, the methods that work the best for that in going forward with education. And then to work with IKEA and other recalling companies to make their recalls more effective so we actually get products removed from homes. To recap, innovation. New ideas and methods to reach consumers with safety news, including recalls and public education campaigns such as Anchor It, along with using technology to track recalls and help companies better prepare for future ones. Regulation. CPSC is charged with regulating product manufacturers. This means acting to recall products that don't mean standards, such as furniture that doesn't meet the minimal standard. It means following up on reporting requirements and not letting poor efforts by recalling companies just slide. It means using every tool in the toolbox to assure safe products, from stiff civil penalties to filing suit to force a needed recall to recalls, reporting, and compliance. And finally, transparency. CPSC is a public agency. Small steps, such as the posting of some recall effectiveness data, were encouraging, but the practice of the consumer always being the last to know they have a dangerous product in their home must end. Using saferproducts.gov more effectively, increasing the recall information available, and finding new ways to communicate should be a priority. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. McGee. The first child to die from an IKEA dresser was recorded in 1989. By 2014, there were six documented children's deaths from IKEA dressers. Some of these were quietly settled with families with no publicity. The last two of these six children to die were killed by the IKEA mom dresser in 2014. By 2015, these two families were pursuing litigation against IKEA, and in July of 2015, in response to those deaths, IKEA decided to issue a repair kit program where if a consumer requested it, they would send out anchor kits for free to consumers. Advocate groups warned IKEA that it wasn't enough. The attorney of these two families appeared on national news in early 2016 saying it wasn't good enough and another child was going to die if they didn't recall these dressers off the market. My husband Jeremy and I had no idea of any of this. On February 14th, 2016, our precious son Ted, who was just 22 months old, died when the IKEA mom dresser fell on him. We had never heard of this repair kit program. In fact, we initially thought Ted's death was a freak accident because we had never even heard of a tip over accident before. Four days after he died, while sitting on the floor in my dead son's bedroom, I googled IKEA dresser deaths on my phone. A friend of mine had heard something about IKEA dressers being unstable and it prompted my search. My heart sank when the first thing that appeared was Ted's mom dresser, as well as a flood of news stories about the other two precious boys, Curran Collis and Camden Ellis, who had died from the same mom dresser line in 2014. 
I was completely devastated to learn this. At that time in my life, I watched the news almost every morning. I was busy raising my family, had attained a master's degree, and was working a corporate job at a Fortune 500 company. I represented many mothers. I would rate myself as moderate with keeping up with current events. And I had no idea that children were dying from unstable furniture or that the risk this unstable dresser posed to my child. Two days after Ted's funeral, I called the attorney representing these two families, the same man who had appeared on national news just weeks before, predicting that another death was going to happen. And I learned that day that Ted's mom dresser did not meet safety standards, and it didn't have to, because the standards for making furniture are voluntary, and that companies do not legally have to comply with these standards in order to sell furniture in the United States. I was appalled. At this point, Ted was the seventh child to die from an Ikea dresser, and it didn't appear that the company was doing much about it other than saying something along the lines of, sorry for your loss, you really should have anchored your furniture. We were learning so much information about this in a very short period of time. We were overwhelmed with Ted's death, which was just a couple weeks prior at this point and sickened at the thought that this could happen to another child. My husband and I felt it was necessary to press this company to finally do something about this. We didn't know much about this process. We were told it might take years. We were told we would face judgment from other people surrounding a tip over death as many families had experienced before us. But none of this mattered to us because all we could think is that Ted's death might not be the last one from a tip over. In June of 2016, four months after Ted's death, IKEA, facing pressure, voluntarily recalled 29 million dressers because they did not meet safety standards. We were elated to know that Ted's dresser was finally off the market. In the fall of 2016, we learned that yet another child had died from the mom dresser back in 2011, but the family hadn't reported it publicly. This was completely understandable given the immense pain the death of a child brings to a family. But learning this meant that Ted was actually the eighth child to die in 27 years from an IKEA dresser. In December of 2016, IKEA settled with our three families. Among several stipulations of the settlement, our families were awarded $50 million and the company agreed to never sell dressers that didn't meet standards again. Why did it take this to get a company to comply with standards? Because they're voluntary. As 2017 rolled around, advocates warned IKEA they weren't doing enough to promote their recall. By the one year mark, there were an estimated 28 million of the 29 million recalled dressers still unaccounted for. And it was confusing that IKEA was selling the new furniture that met safety standards under the same name as the dressers that didn't meet the standards. Advocates were scared another child would die. And in May of 2017, it happened. An innocent boy in California died when the IKEA mom dresser fell on him almost a year after the recall. His family hadn't heard of the recall. We now know of nine children who have died from IKEA dressers. Are there more? Possibly. I wanna be very clear today that this is an industry-wide problem. My story involves just one company but it represents what's happening in the market today because standards are not mandatory and we aren't moving fast enough to address this problem. My son's death is a live example of what happens when we wait to address an apparent issue. So I sit here in 2018 wondering when enough is enough. Wondering when the next family is going to live through the hell and the heartbreak that my family has experienced. Who is the next innocent child to lose their life? And why are we okay with selling unstable dressers to consumers and instructing them to finish making it safe by anchoring it to a wall? Why can't we require all furniture makers to design and sell safe, stable dressers so that consumers are safe from the moment they purchase the item? We know that it's possible because some furniture makers are doing it today. So today I ask the CPSC to acknowledge that the time is now to address this issue. 
I urge you to not wait any longer. We do not need to wait for another child to die. Please get this on the priority list for fiscal year 2019 and 2020. I encourage the CPSC to use the new data released in March of 2018 from Consumer Reports, along with the Furniture Stability Report released in August of 2016 from Kids in Danger and Shane's Foundation, to first strengthen the current furniture making standards to 60 pounds. This takes into consideration heavier children, the real world scenario of clothing and all dressers and dressers being used in carpeted bedrooms. Second, make the voluntary standards for furniture making mandatory. And third, recall all the dressers on the market today that do not meet today's voluntary standards and call on companies and the industry as a whole to widely publicize their recalls with the same vigor and tenacity they used in selling the dressers to consumers in the first place. Thank you for allowing me an opportunity to share my story today and have a voice in how the upcoming year fiscal dollars will be spent. Thank you very much, Ms. McGee. Dr. Zuckerman. Thank you, thank you, Janet. Um, it's hard to talk after that because um, the issues that she's raised are really very similar to the kinds of issues that I'm going to be raising, but from a very different perspective. But um, as a mother, um, it's very hard to listen to. I'm Dr. Diana Zuckerman. I'm president of the National Center for Health Research. And our center is a nonprofit think tank that conducts research, scrutinizes research done by others, um, tries to make sense of the meaning of the research, looks at contradictions in research, and tries to use that information to improve programs, policies, and services, and products um, in this country. So, our mission overlaps in a, in a strong way with what the Consumer Product Safety Commission does, and we care very much about the work that you do and um, depend on you. But when we're looking at research, it's sometimes a lot more difficult because there's so little of it from, for so many of the products that we're looking at. Today I'm going to talk about different kinds of risks than most other speakers, I think. I'm going to be talking about the ones we can't see. And that's what my uh, priorities are going to focus on, not because others aren't important, but because as a scientist, I think that a, a unique perspective that I bring. I'm trained in epidemi epidemiology at Yale Medical School. I was on the faculty at Yale and Vassar, and a researcher at Harvard before coming to Washington as a uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science uh, fellow. And I've been here for the 30 years ever since. So I'm going to try to give the big picture. And it's hard to do, but I want to talk about the fact that we are surrounded by chemicals we can't see. <laughs> this is not something that uh, we like to think about, but as an epidemiologist, that's how I think. And I know that in the dust that we're breathing today, when I touch this table, we are exposing ourselves to chemicals, um, some of which are safer than others. And we're basically in a chemical soup. And because we're exposed, from, by, uh, exposed to so many chemicals from so many sources, it's hard to distinguish which ones are the worst ones, which are the ones we should regulate uh, more carefully. Um, so I'm going to focus on three issues. We know that these chemicals have risks. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But what we don't know very much about is how much risk. And I know that's an issue that's uh, been raised in, in uh, previous meetings. So I want to try to address that a little bit. Um, and how essential your role is and how essential it has been. So the three kinds of um, priorities I'm going to be talking about are organo organohalogen flame retardants, I want to say how uh, pleased we are that you're moving ahead with that. I want to urge you to have a CHAP 
uh, convened as soon as possible. These are chemicals that are particularly of concern because they just don't disappear. They last forever. If they're here in this room, they stay in this room. If they're on our skin, we can wash our hands, but they're going to just come back. So even though we don't know exactly what the risks are, we know how difficult it is to get rid of those risks. So I, w so I think a CHAP is the clear way to do it. I think CHAPs have been uh, very effective in the past, and I really urge you to move forward on that as uh, soon as you can. I want to spend a little bit more time talking about artificial turf. This is an issue that uh, has really gone under the radar for a lot of uh, families and a lot of legislators. Um, the, the state of Maryland did have a bill introduced this year to stop using state money to um, install artificial turf fields. Uh, the DC government currently has a one-year moratorium on uh, the use of any uh, DC funds for uh, particular kinds of artificial turf fields, ones made with crumb rubber. Um, one of the issues with artificial turf fields, and I want to say I'm talking about the fields that, you know, used to be called astroturf fields, the artificial grass, but also the playgrounds that little children play on that are very pretty and very co colorful and they feel kind of spongy and you think these seem so great, but these are, all of these are made with uh, chemicals from petroleum that have certain risks that we know about. We don't know exactly what the risks are for each individual child, but think of this, you know, whether it's your child playing or child or grandchild playing uh, soccer or practicing every day on these fields or on these playgrounds uh, for an hour recess every day, um, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, these exposures are constant. So we know that they do in include chemicals that can um, disrupt hormones, and hormone-disrupting chemicals can uh, cause or exacerbate obesity, attention deficit disorder, early puberty, and by early puberty, I'm talking about children as young as eight and nine starting puberty. I mean, these are children at an age they're still learning how to make change for a dollar and they're uh, having hormonal uh, episodes that we usually think of as for teenagers, but young children are having these feelings and confusion uh, from hormone disruption, and also that they eventually can cause cancer. So these are extremely important exposures, and these kind of chemicals are uh, ubiquitous in our environment, and we really need to have a better handle on them. One of the most frightening things about artificial turf to me is how little information is available about what's in them. Uh, a lot of that information is considered trade secret. You can't find it anywhere. There's no federal agency that has required studies of these chemicals prior to their use. And so every time uh, independent researchers, such as ones at Yale um, Medical School, do research, and find problems with particular kinds of artificial turf or crumb rubber or whatever it is, the companies come up with new products that we don't know about. So for that reason, um, I really, I, I know that the Consumer Product Safety Commission and the EPA has been concerned about artificial turf and concerned about um, playgrounds, and I'm really asking that you move forward on this because uh, millions and millions of dollars are being spent in each community just on these fields. And um, parents really have no clue at, that these are risks. Um, also just want to mention they get very, very hot in the summer. And so I've taken temperatures of fields around here that uh, and playgrounds where on a nice fall day where it's in the 60s, uh, it's actually 140 degrees or warmer on these fields. And on a sunny, hot day, it can go well over 160 degrees. Um, the last thing I'm just going to mention are uh, phthalates, uh, which um, I think that the Consumer Product Safety Commission's done a terrific job 
uh, legislation was passed that our center was actually instrumental on years ago to uh, restrict certain phthalates in toys and products for children under three. Um, and the chap that you all put together has been terrific, but I just wanna say those are not the ex only exposures to phthalates. Um, it isn't just toys and it isn't just those products specifically for children under three. Kids are being exposed to a lot of uh, other products that have phthalates. And the prenatal exposure is of particular concern because um, there's no restrictions on that. So um, in summary, I just want to say uh, how much we depend on the work that you're doing and admire and respect it and ask that uh, we know that you're small and you have limited resources, but um, there are these risks that don't seem as immediate because we can't see them, but uh, we're being exposed to them every day. Our children and grandchildren are, and I really ask you to do whatever you can to uh, move those up on the priority list. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Wiestep. Acting Chair Burkle, Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony to the Consumer Product Safety Commission. My name is Greg Wishtat. I serve as President of Portable Generator Manufacturers Association. PGMA is a voluntary trade organization which began in 2009 and includes major manufacturers of portable generators representing a majority of market share. PGMA and its members are dedicated to the safe use of power portable generators as such, PGMA has developed and maintains the ANSI standard for portable generators, known as ANSI PGMA G300. Since this standard first achieved consensus and recognition in 2015, PGMA and its members have been working towards an update to the standard to address the carbon monoxide, CO, hazard posed by misuse of portable generators. This is a voluntary standard that our members are committed to follow Many of our member products are compliant with this voluntary standard today. Since last March's hearing on potential rulemaking activities at CPSC, our members have made significant progress towards the update of G300. These include investing tens of thousands of hours in the development and testing and verification of requirements contained within the standard, forming a steering committee comprised of independent stakeholders to provide input and feedback throughout the standard development process, holding four technical summits where the current draft of the new standard requirements, member data, and analysis was shared in order to get valuable feedback on the revision, facilitating the visit of CPSC commissioners and staff at several of the PGMA members' facilities in Wisconsin last year where they were able to get a first-hand look at the work that was being done to develop the solution. The feedback indicated that the commission was very impressed with the work that had been accomplished. In fact, it was further indicated that the staff felt that detection and shutoff was the appropriate approach to the hazard. It just wasn't ready for review at the time CPSC staff initially studied this approach. Working together to replicate the efforts that CPSC staff and NIST undertook in the NPRM to estimate the impact to fatalities avoided through extensive analysis using the CONTAM tool, this tool has now been formalized in a technical report provided to you today. This report has also been validated by an independent engineering firm, Exponent. And lastly, providing a comprehensive set of requirements to address all aspects of the hazard. At CPSC staff's request, the standard includes a robust set of requirements for tamper resistance, reliability, and operation over a broad range of environmental extremes that will ensure the safety systems on compliant generators will continue to operate for the life of the generator. Additionally, it includes requirements for post shutdown notification and instruction to the user. I'm pleased to share with you today that the latest revision of the PGMA G300 standard, 2018, which now includes requirements for an automatic carbon monoxide detection and shutoff, 
has achieved overwhelming consensus of more than 90% acceptance amongst the diverse Canvas group. This includes CPSC staff who also voted in favor of the revision. It is now in the final stages of ANSI recognition. Many of the PGMA members are already working towards compliance with the standard today. The standard includes an effective date of March 31, 2020, meaning that all G300 compliant generators produced after March 31, 2020 must meet the requirements for the CO safety shutoff system. Additionally, the new standard would address 99% of the carbon monoxide related fatalities resulting from misuse of portable generators where carbon monoxide can accumulate. For comparison purposes, the emissions reductions required in the present NPRM were estimated to be only 42% effective at the avoidance of these fatalities. The PGMA G300 safety standard for portable generators provides the assurance of safety while at the same time avoiding undesirable effects such as significant price increases making generators less accessible to those who need them in times of emergency, fire hazards resulting from increased exhaust temperatures, or not being easily applicable to all types of portable generators. As a whole, CPSC has amassed an enormous amount of work to progress the portable generator safety efforts to its present state. PGMA and its members are very appreciative of this effort as it was invaluable to help us in the revisions to the voluntary standard. Our progress in such a short time would not have been possible without the efforts of CPSC. This process should be viewed by all as a success where industry and government work together towards the best solution. Given that the voluntary standard has proven to be affected, effective, excuse me, adopted by the Canvas Group and compliance has been demonstrated, we feel that it is no longer necessary for CPSC to continue with mandatory rulemaking. We request that CPSC terminate the proposed rule and allow the voluntary standard to achieve its goals. Further, we request that CPSC redirect the resources and efforts that would have been expended to complete the portable generator rule towards the improvement of the incident tracking surveillance systems, which allow for the tracking of hazards such as carbon monoxide poisoning from the misuse of portable generators. Today, these systems do not allow for simple determinations such as, does a generator that is implicated in a CO poisoning incident contain the carbon monoxide safety label that was mandated by, C mandated by CPSC rule in 2007. Improving the data that is used by CPSC to track incidents associated with all consumer products will make it much easier to identify the hazard patterns and create solutions for them. In particular, for portable generators, this data will be invaluable to evaluate the effectiveness of G300. It would also provide valuable data for PGMA and its members to use when making future revisions to ANSI PGMA G300 to further improve the safety of portable generators. Resources could also be expended on our public outreach campaign entitled, Take It Outside. We would like to thank CPSC staff and their efforts throughout the rulemaking process. The work completed by CPSC and NIST has been extremely beneficial for our members to complete the work on the voluntary standard. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Ms. Zitterek? Thank you. Zitterich, sorry. Good morning. Thanks to Chairman Burkle and this board for the opportunity to come before this commission to bring awareness for our battle for the truth. My name is Pamela Zadarich, and I'm a co the co-founder and vice president of a nonprofit organization, Midway Defective Window Recipients. I'm a lifelong resident of Chicago, Illinois, and for the record, I love my city. The Midway Defective, Defective Window Recipients Nonprofit was codified in August of 2017 to assist with advocating on behalf of the community for the grave concern that has fallen on the tens of thousands of residents surrounding both the Chicago Midway and O'Hare International Airports in Chicago, Illinois. We are in need of your help, guidance, direction, regulatory guidelines, testing procedures, and rulemaking. The problem at hand is in regard to the defective and harmful PVC window and door products that were installed in the homes near both airports in an effort to reduce the impact of aircraft noise. The program that sponsors this sound insulating environmental program is the Residential Sound Installation Program uh, by and through the Chicago Department of Aviation. 
The PVC window and door products were ultimately found to be defective by and through homeowners that discovered the smell of a harmful off-gassing stench of burning plastic from the PVC when exposed to direct sunlight. I got my windows in 2011, but, not, but didn't begin to smell the smell until late summer 2016. It took me until March of 2017 to discover that the source of the smell was my RSIP windows. This concerning issue was brought to the attention of the CDA and their personnel dating back to as early as spring of 2015, but not acknowledged as an alarming and dangerous issue until April 2017. I want to be clear to all that the mechanism that starts these windows smelling is the sun. It is not the heat. It can be 105 and high humidity and cloudy and the windows will not off gas. But if it's sunny and minus 10, my windows will off gas. Think of it this way, you could be in a hot room and be hot, but you must be in the sun to get a sunburn. And like a faucet, the sun makes the off-gassing turn uh, on and off. Since my first call to the RSIP office to present day, the CDA and its agents have undertaken a campaign of lies, misinformation, fraud, dissuasion, and attrition tactics, just to name a few. What are they trying to hide and why? This behavior has raised several serious questions about the CDA's handling of this program and the $550 million they managed. Questionable and concerning behavior from, practice, um, from their pure procurement practices, engagement with a corrupt embezzling business owner long after the CDA, uh, CDA was aware of same, and so on. Uh, specifics which are outlined in detail in our submission. The ultimate result of which was the bankruptcy of Sound Solutions and Windows and Doors who made a good portion of these windows, leaving thousands of residents without a warranty when this problem first came to the CDA's attention in 2015. Uh, Sound Solutions went out of business in 2014. Um, in 2015, um, the CDA admits to replacing three whole houses of windows for this issue. One of these homes, not one full block from mine, and with the same install year as mine, 2011, was visited and inspected by the same gentleman that stood in my kitchen in May of 2017 and lied right to my face and told me if my windows were replaced for this problem, I'd be the first. The CDA treated this as an anomaly, but think, windows that smell so bad it warrants a complete rip out and reinstallation, how did that get justified internally? No, no nonconformance, no engineering evaluation, no corrective action. It's nonsense. So I started small and on social media. I approached my neighbors and as much of the community I could any way I could. Word spread, local press and media got involved, neighbors got involved, our wonderful alderman Marty Quinn got involved and other politicians came on board. And we've had some progress on this issue, but we are at an impasse and that is why we are seeking your help. To date, Hundreds of screenings have been confirmed with these windows. As of March 27th, 2018, a total of 839 homes have been screened, a smell test, and 448 have been confirmed. That's over a 53% confirmation rate. Um, the FAA, who provides 80% of the funds for this program, who's been silent, recently recognized uh, this problem on a March 2nd, 2018 letter to our organization that stated Washington headquarters confirmed this is an unprecedented situation. We still have very dis difficult issues to overcome. There are still over 16,000 addresses that have not been given proper notification by the CDA. Amic Foster Wheeler, the firm hired by the city of Chicago, testified under oath that they've never even done this type of testing. We have many questions and issues with the chamber testing that was performed, seeing that this was the benchmark test for isolating what VOCs, volatile organic chemicals, they would look for when performing their in-home testing, um, without the, but without the impact of UV on these windows in chamber, they basically shut the windows off. They put them in a dark chamber. They did not mimic the proper conditions. We also have questions of chain of custody of the windows used in the chamber. Timing of in-home testing was definitely not ideal, late October, beginning of November, all of which resulted in inconclusive results with no root cause. But based on incomplete and inconclusive test results, the CDA issued a press release in January and did a homeowner mailing stating, Chicago Department of Aviation announces initial window testing finds no evidence of health impact. 
I find this premature, negligent, misleading, and purposeful. They admit they have no idea what the root cause is, but they can declare a scientific conclusion. They also state there's no impact on air, indoor air quality, which I can tell you is utter nonsense. On sunny, beautiful days, it fills homeowners with fear. Now we have a third manufacturer, Harvey's, Harvey Windows, added to the list. Harvey is cur a current supplier to this program and has been confirmed with off-gassing windows, which completely changes the theory of only bad sound solution windows. The CDA claims the smell from Harvey windows is not the same as the smell uh, from the sound solution windows. I personally put my nose on the windows of three separate homes with Harvey windows and there is no difference between what is coming off my sound solution windows than what is coming off the Harvey windows. And I have been plagued with this smell for two years now. I know the smell very well. It's burning plastic. Homeowners advise us that are, they're suffering, suffering with a long list of health issues such as coughing, headaches, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, nasal eye and throat irritation, upper respiratory infections, chronic sinus infections, difficulty breathing, asthma, which in some pediatric cases is, ex is extreme, bronchitis, fatigue, and so on. Unless proper testing is undertaken and the root cause is identified, we as a whole will never know for sure about long-term health issues. We owe it to our loved ones, our community, past and future residents of these buildings, but especially to our children, the true and exact scientifically proven information as to exactly what we are being exposed to. In addition, there have been several reports and I have personally witnessed catastrophic mechanical failures which could result in significant injury or death. Is it possible that the mechanical failures of the hidden medical components are tied to the off-gassing? Considering that when PVC burns, it produces hydrogen chloride, also known as hydrochloric acid. This in turn breaks down the metal components, metal components in these windows. <clears throat> Something to consider, my front east-facing windows were noticeably off-gassing last year. Thankfully, we have a large 74-year-old silver maple in front of our yard, which has protected this side of our home up till now. Just the other, other morning while having breakfast around 8 a.m., I began to smell the smell coming off these particular windows. Due to recent sewer work, several branches have been cut off my tree, and I have no idea what the new outcome will be for these these east facing windows. There seems to be an exposure tipping point. Exactly what that is, I cannot say for certain, but I'm confident if a proper scientific study was done and overseen by the Consumer Product Safety Commission, that could be determined along with the root cause and our toxic exposure. Think of it, it compares to the Chinese drywall matter or the lumber liquidators, liquidators vinyl flooring issues. I think our issue qualifies for precedent distinction because we cannot easily throw these windows out like a lead-laden piece of cheap jewelry. We cannot drag them to the curb. The deed is done. These windows are an integral structure to our homes. Take the water poisoning case in Flint, Michigan, for instance. There was so much misinformation fed to the homeowners, rig testing practices, attempts to appease at first, and in turn a demand that waivers be signed and absolving anyone of wrongdoing, etc. What has taken place in Chicago so far mirrors the Flint case. It was not until higher governing agencies stepped in to help that community that the truth was finally uncovered. Criminal charges were filed against state officials in that case. We respectfully request and urgently plea for help from the Consumer Product Safety Commission in any capacity. There is no precedent regarding this matter. I cannot stress enough how complicated and serious this issue is. I believe our written submission, submission clearly supports our contention that the CDA is not to be trusted with this investigation. It clearly supports our need for Consumer Product Safety Commission oversight for further investigation of the CDA and proper testing of our windows and air quality in our homes. Therefore, I, Pamela Zidarich, Vice President of Midway Defective Window Recipients, asks you to please help. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now turn to the commission for questions. Uh, we will each have 10 minute rounds and I will begin the questioning. Um, and before I begin my questions again, I wanna thank all of you for being here today. Uh, in, in particular, Ms. McGee, um, one of the most profound things I have seen in my five years here at the commission has been the courage and uh, the willingness of parents who had suffered an unspeakable loss, the loss of a child, to come forward with their ideas, with their concerns, and with their advice to us. And so I know I speak for my colleagues, and I'm sure they will speak for themselves, but I want to thank you for your courage and your willingness to come here today and testify on behalf of your son, Ted. I truly appreciate it. And as a mother of six and 17 grandkids, it's an unspeakable tragedy, and I thank you. 
Um, Ms. Coles, I wanted to talk um, about safe sleep. You mentioned the 104s and safe sleep. There are various messages out there about safe sleep. And, um, you know, there's safe sleep, bear is best, all kinds of messaging. How can we better provide consistent messaging about that issue? And is there a way that CPSC can partner with KID or with the American Academy of Pediatrics, which I'll ask that question later as well, uh, to have a consistent message so that the consumer is not con confused? Yes, thank you for that question. I'm mean, Obviously, uh, safe sleep is so important to our organization and really to parents everywhere. And it is a difficult message for us, for others, and I often point to it because it's in some ways what's best for baby, which is bear is best, on their back, in a safe crib with nothing else in the crib, seems counterintuitive to new parents. And so it is a, an uphill battle. For instance, talking about bicycle helmets, everyone can immediately see why a bicycle helmet would protect your child, and it makes sense. So I think it is a difficult message, and I think there are also many parts to it. The American Academy of Pediatrics has the best statement in terms of all the things that go into preventing SIDS or SUID, unexpected sleep deaths, um, or suffocation. Um, and I would, you know, I'm not sure we can boil it down to one phrase. Uh, CPSC has been using bear is best, which is when you talk about the product itself, which is your, you know, area of concern, is certainly the best advice to p always put a baby in a bear crib. On their backs is the second part of it. Many groups use the ABCs alone on their back in a safe crib. Um, and so I think that works. But I think that those messages, any attempt to soften that message, and you know, I mean, and I, this is why I constantly point to the use of crib bumpers pads is confusing that message because you can't say bear is best and then say, but bumpers are okay because that's not bear. Um, so I think a clear message and then, you know, supporting the products that support the message is the way to go. And we are always more than happy to work with you, with AAP, with anyone on this issue. We appreciate Thank that. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Zuckerman, um, I'd like to just talk to you a little bit. Your testimony asked the CPSC to expand our work on phthalates and to include other household products. Um, can you be specific about the types of products you're referring to? Um, and at the same time, you mentioned these large gaps in research about the danger of these products. Can you provide us more detail about those gaps you're identifying? Sure. Thank you for that question. Um, I know that uh, other products that you've considered, um, as I recall, are things like uh, rubber boots and rain raincoats and boots. Kids aren't necessarily chewing them <laughs> the way they chew teething toys, but sometimes they do chew them. And uh, they are around, and they're, uh, those chemicals are getting into the air because they're in our homes. And so, um, you know, I think there are a lot of products like that. You know, one of the challenges, I think, of this is the, the prenatal exposure challenge, because if you're concerned about prenatal exposure, then you have to be concerned about all products, not just products for children. Um, it is true that research showed that um, uh, certainly prior to uh, the restrictions on certain phthalates, there were a lot more phthalates in the dust of children's, of infant bedrooms than there were in uh, other rooms in the house. So there, you know, we know that getting those products out of infant bedrooms and children's bedrooms is important, but there's still going to be exposure in the rest of the house. Um, I, I, I know one product that um, concerns me, and I haven't seen uh, research on this, frankly, are the, um, the plug-in uh, products that smell very nice um, because those are phthalates. And we are putting them in an entire room. And you know what better room to put them in than a child's room right near the, um, uh, where the, you know, the dirty diapers are. So you know, there's a lot of uh, concern that our desire for a better smelling uh, child's room or home you know, could be contributing to these chemicals. So I, I'm happy to get back to you with more details. But you know, I think one of the big issues that's hard for uh, for you all and for all of us is where do you draw the line? Because if you want to reduce exposures prenatally, then 
it's really hard to draw the line. Otherwise, we could say, well, how about all products for children under three or all products for kids under five? But if we care about prenatal exposure, we have to care about other things as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Wishtat, um, I want to begin by commending PGMA for all of the work and the advances you've made in the shutoff technology and your willingness to host commissioners as well as staff uh, in, in sharing uh, all that you have done and, and the research that's been done and the work that's been done. I am very interested in what you mentioned this morning here about the effective rate um, of the shutoff technology being at 99% versus what our NPR was at 48%. Can you speak a little bit more about that and those findings? And I understand you're going to re release the report. Yes, thank, thank you very much, Chairman, and, and thank you for the kind words of the efforts that PGMA has undertaken. Um, our members have uh, completed a similar analysis to what CPSC staff did in the NPRM uh, using the CONTAM tools that NIST has developed in order to model a shutoff mechanism as opposed to an emissions reduction uh, and then incorporating this across a varied range of emissions. Um, the results of that analysis are where we have indicated that there's a 99% effectivity rate of fatality avoidance. And that's for indoor spaces, which uh, as we define it as any space where carbon monoxide can accumulate, which can be seen in the modeling. So. That could be uh, in your basement in the home where, where we've seen some people um, attempt to operate these machines, or it could be in a car park where the environment is partially open and exposed, but yet there's enough of a closed off environment there that the carbon monoxide from the generator continues to accumulate. Um, we basically followed the same roadmap that CPSC staff used. And recently we took, um, we've been presenting these results uh, throughout the course of the last year as they've been unfolding. Uh, but now that that activity is completed amongst our members, uh, we wrote it up into an official sort of technical report, uh, which we have subsequently uh, contracted a, an engineering firm at, at the request of many on our steering committee to have our results third party validated. Uh, to go through and, and we gave them an open book. We submitted all of our data, which is uh, gigabytes and gigabytes of simulation runs, um, gave them open access to all of our members in order to uh, re replicate some of the work we've done and, and validate our results. And they have since done that. And that report has um, now been published and uh, I believe we sent it to yourself and all the other commissioners here just within the last couple days. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned that um, the shutoff technology avoids some sh um, fire hazards um, resulting from the increase in exhaust temperatures. Can you, is this a hazard that can arise in the low CO generators and low emission technology? And can you ex just talk a little bit about that? Yes, thank you. The, uh, the first of all, let me say the shutoff technology is an independent system that sits alongside the generator and doesn't inhibit any of the other operations of the generator or force you to change the generator's operation in any way. By contrast, if you are targeting any reduction of emissions from the generator, the strategy, the, the technical solution for that is essentially to take machines that currently run rich or, f or fuel rich uh, to a lean environment, which is where uh, in the combustion process less carbon monoxide is produced. As a result of running them lean and as a result of adding catalysts to the system, um, the exhaust temperatures can rise by as much as 300 degrees Fahrenheit on a typical engine generator. Um, we have concerns that this type of an approach uh, could result in additional fire hazards from portable generators that are used too close to combustibles, burn hazards, fuel spillage on hot components and exhaust systems. Uh, catalysts require this heat to effectively operate and take away the noxious chemicals coming out of the exhaust. Thank you. As my time winds down, I have one last request. I don't mean to sound ungrateful at all because you've made tremendous strides, but if there is a way that you could move that effective date up sooner, I think that that would really be, I can't express to you how much appreciated that would be because CO deaths continue to happen and this shutoff technology can prevent those deaths. Thank you very much yes. for all of you for being here. Commissioner Adler. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I want to echo uh, the Chairman's thanks to all of you for showing up and for testifying. And Ms. McGee, 
particularly as a parent, uh, I know how much strength and courage it takes to come and tell your story, and I can only tell you that uh, it's one that we eagerly await and one that we take to heart. And I actually did want to ask a, a question or two about that. I saw that in your testimony you rated yourself as a moderate in following current events. Trust me, given your educational background, that probably puts you in the top 5%. I'm always struck by these studies that ask people whether the sun revolves around the earth or the earth revolves around the sun. Uh, and 25% of people think the sun uh, revolves around the earth. And only 20% can name who they're, can even tell us how many senators there are or name their senator. So you are what I would call an extremely well-educated parent. And that's the point that I wanted to raise. You are a well-educated parent, yet you had no idea that children were dying from unanchored furniture. Uh, to me, this suggests that while education is important, and I think we all agree that it's important, it can't be relied on exclusively to protect the public. So I guess my question is, how realistic would it be for us to expect that you or any other parent would be able to follow all of the hazards that apply to their children? I think as a parent, you, you do the best that you can and you, um, you know, we childproofed our whole house. You know, we had our cabinets locked. We had a safety gate up. I had his cord blind out of reach. Um, I thought that I was doing everything that I had to to keep him safe. Um, and so, there are so many things to think about as a parent with keeping your child safe. And I feel that a piece of furniture falling on my child shouldn't need to be one of them. When we could build safety into the design. I also want to point something out, and that is with respect to the lawsuit that you brought. And I think this is often a point that is lost on uh, our friends in industry, that even if there's not a mandatory standard, and even if there, there's only a voluntary standard, very often courts will treat failure to comply with a voluntary standard the, which results in an injury or death to a child can be considered negligence per se. But I also noticed that you acted, my term, as a private attorney general in insisting that the company agree never to produce uh, or sell products that failed a, a standard. And I'm curious, uh, how did this provision get into the settlement? Was that something your attorney insisted on? Was that something the parents insisted on? Or was it both? I would say both, but that was definitely something that my husband and I had in mind when we did this lawsuit, this was not about money, this was not about anything aside from getting this product off the shelf and getting this company to be held accountable. Again, thank you so much for appearing here and for your pursuit uh, of justice in your lawsuit. Uh, Dr. Zuckerman, welcome again. It's nice to see you. Uh, you point out that nearly everybody uh, today has uh, what we call OFRs, the organohalogen flame retardants, in measurable levels in their bodies. So I'm just curious, if we went back 100 years, would uh, not what we'd know, but would you estimate that OFRs would be present? Or even if we went back 50 years, would they be present in pretty much everybody? Well, I certainly don't think so. I mean, I, but there's no data. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so many of these chemicals are new. And, um, you know, Nancy talked about innovation, and we think of innovation as a, a very positive thing. But in chemicals, not so much. So that there are so many new chemicals being introduced every year and have been introduced over the last few decades that we're going to only find out, uh, you know, 10 years from now. The example I always like to give is that we, you know, everybody agrees that smoking causes lung cancer. But people start smoking in their teens and they get lung cancer in their 40s and 50s and 60s. So it often takes, even for something that is a very well-known, well-established carcinogen, it can still take 40 years for it to show up. And so the, that's the concern with all of these, uh, whether it's the organohalogens or these other chemicals, that it's the chemicals themselves, it's the combination of all of them that we're going to find out at some point what, what the impact is. And we don't know now. Well, I'd like to repeat a question that I asked during our hearing on organohalogens, and that is, uh, we don't have complete information about all organohalogens, but I am curious, have you 
run across an organohalogen that you believe has been given a safe bill of health that, that is not, doesn't present a hazard. Sometimes we don't know one way or the other, but where we do know, have we found an organohalogen uh, that we would call safe? Um, I think it might be possible to find one, but we have not found one. Uh, I did also want to ask you about your crumb rubber concerns. Um, and I think we all know, and I think the industry acknowledges, that there's some really nasty chemicals in crumb rubber. But what the industry folks have said to us when they've come in to talk to us is that they're so strongly bonded to one another that there's no off-gassing uh, to speak of, even in these very, very hot conditions. Uh, it seems counterintuitive, but I'm curious. Have, do you know of any studies that give us information one way or the other about that? Uh, well, I'll say two things. One is, um, for those of you who uh, have had chil have children, and especially, let me just say, teenage boys who aren't going to tell you what's going on when they're practicing soccer. I only found out last year, my son is now 27, that when he used to play soccer on an artificial turf field on a hot day, it stunk. It smelled really bad, and he could see the heat and the chemicals rising, and he knew he was breathing them in, but he just, you know, he's a smart kid, didn't think anything of it, certainly never mentioned it to me. So, you know, we, we know that these chemicals, I mean, you can see and smell them, so what's the chances that they're so you know, strongly bonded that they're not off-gassing? It it's, doesn't make any sense. And I, I, I give... Uh, guest lectures at universities in the area and the same thing when I talk when I mention this you know s somebody in the classroom is going to say oh yeah when we play you know it smells bad on a hot day so uh yeah um th the other thing I just want to say briefly is that having testified in DC um at the DC council and also at the state of Maryland legislation uh letters um house of delegates there's always experts talking about how safe these products are, and they, I don't know how else to say this nicely, they make up stuff. I mean, they say that, you know, that research has been done and research proves it's safe. I've heard them say the Consumer Product Safety Commission says they're perfectly safe. I've heard them say EPA says they're perfectly safe. They're saying things that aren't true, and but most people listening don't know they're not true. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wiestadt, again, I want to thank you for the courtesy you and uh, other manufacturers showed in giving us a tour in Wisconsin uh, of the facilities that uh, are producing the gas generators. I did want to voice one word of caution, uh, though. Uh, you said that uh, CPSC staff feels that detection and shutoff is the appropriate approach to the hazard. Um, and I think that's a bit of an overstatement of where the staff is. I think when I've talked to staff, they've said, uh, we, we like the, I, the direction you're moving in. We like the direction that UL is moving in. And it's a major technical challenge uh, for us to try to determine which is the better approach. And the staff really is immersed in assessing both of them. And I think they're doing an excellent job. But I wouldn't want uh, people to gain the impression that staff has blessed the PGMA standard versus the UL standard. They've actually blessed both. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, raise that uh, as a concern. If you have any response, please feel free. Um, yeah, please. Um, thank you. The, uh, the, the quote I was referring to was a comment that came back from several of the members who, when staff visited, and some of the commissioners as well, to our companies, it was expressed that the original belief of staff was that a detection and shutoff methodology would be the most appropriate solution to the problem, and they'd felt that in the beginning. However, uh, it being more than 10 years since it was really studied by staff, uh, the advancements in that technology have now made it possible where then they would have seen significant challenges that would have needed to be overcome in that case. Thank you very much. A quick question, Ms. Zidarich. Um, I hear the problem that you're having in Chicago, and I was curious, are you aware of this problem existing at other airports around the country? Is this something your group's heard about? To date, no. And the uh, CDA claims that, but we are still on the hunt, for sure. Uh, thank you all very much. My time has expired. Thank you, Commissioner Adler. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you all again uh, for all of the issues that you've raised for us. This is really important hearing for us, and I really appreciate it. 
Um, I fully intend to explore the, um, the issue of the very dangerous millions of dangerous dressers that are in people's homes and the hidden hazard, Ms. McGee, with another panel. But I just wanted to thank you. I've lost an immediate family member, and I've represented parents like you who have lost children due to somebody else's negligence. And I know what it took to come here today, and I know the motivation. You want to make sure it doesn't happen to somebody else's kid, and we just really appreciate you coming here. Um, Dr. Zuckerman, I want to thank you so much for all of your efforts um, in helping out the CPSC with respect to issues concerning dangerous chemicals. I know we voted seven months ago um, to send the issue of organohalogens to a panel um, at, at NAS. I am extremely frustrated at how slowly everything is moving, and when I see the process, it seems to, like it's going to be forever. But I encourage you to keep pushing, pushing, pushing. Um, uh, even though it looks hopeless, I'm sure sometimes, but it's important to our kids and our grandkids. Um, as everyone knows, soon this agency will be taken over by a Trump-appointed majority, and we can anticipate very different approaches to um, consumer safety. Indeed, I think consumers should be very afraid of what this new majority will do. Um, we know that Commissioner Burkle, then Commissioner, now acting chair, voted against scientists involved in in uh, at, at all independent scientists with respect to phthalates and with respect to organohalogens. She didn't even want to get the scientists involved in evaluating organohalogens, voted in favor of all of the industries that make money off of these dangerous chemicals. So I'm very concerned about that. And my successor, if we don't have any Republicans opposing uh, these confirmations, I'm told they'll be going through very quickly. My successor is somebody who has represented companies that are, that are in favor favor of these toxically dangerous chemicals, including R.J. Reynolds, who I'm told even has advocated including these toxic organohalogens in our furniture. So keep pushing. We owe it to future generations. And hopefully when this administration is gone, we'll go back to consumer safety. Uh, Mr. Wishtat, I, I just wish that the representations uh, made by you on behalf of PGMA um, and by your lobbyist, Mr. Krennic, in a very misleading press release um, recently were true. I really, truly do. Um, portable generators are one of the most dangerous products that we regulate, and the danger is very much hidden. While most people know the portable generators put off carbon monoxide, almost no one knows that we're talking about 450 to 1,000 cars idling in our garage um, in terms of the amount of carbon monoxide that come from these little machines. Our staff, as you know, has spent well over a decade trying unsuccessfully to get your organization and its members to use available technology to make these portable generators safer. Indeed, in my first meeting with you almost five years ago, I suggested maybe at least we could put longer extension cords on so that people can actually put them where they belong, and your organization and your members wouldn't even do that. Seeing no movement by manufacturers, our staff prepared a very thorough and excellent NPR in 2016 in which they concluded that lowering emissions is the only way that we're really going to save lives. They thoroughly examined the possibility of a shutoff switch, and your representation to Mr. To, to Commissioner Adler that, that what they did was 10 years ago is just nonsense. They looked at the shutoff switch because everyone hoped that that would be the answer, because industry wouldn't fight us on a shutoff switch, because it's cheap and it's easy. But that wasn't the answer. Uh, they concluded that it wasn't the answer because of a number of things, but two primary things. One, carbon monoxide migrates, period. So where the carbon monoxide is dangerous enough to kill somebody may not be at the generator. And without lowering the CO emissions rate, the level of the parts per million that you would need it at at the generator to avoid nuisance shutoffs, it would not be such that you could prevent deaths. And it's important to note, and I think Commissioner Adler was probably more gently um, saying this. Um, everybody says things more gently than I do. But it's important to know that nothing has changed with respect to our staff engineers' analyses and conclusions since 2016. Nothing. Fortunately, UL went ahead with passing a voluntary standard that requires both lowering CO emissions and a shutoff mechanism at the generator. And I'm delighted that we have at least one manufacturer who I am told has now certified their generators to meet that standard. Now, with respect to PGMA, I, as you know, 
I was so optimistic when I visited Wisconsin almost 10 months ago that you really had found a way to address this with just a shutoff mechanism because that would be the cheap, easy way to go. Um, and I hoped that your data would back up your recommended updates to your PGMA uh, G300 standard that would only require a shutoff mechanism. However, since then, and I'm not used to, frankly, having industry ignore my emails, but you have consistently ignored multiple requests from me, and I know my CPSC staff, our CPSC staff has also requested the data, all of the data that back up your recommendation that this is the answer, which is contrary. I'm going to remind my colleague that we're here to listen to the panelists speak, and I would appreciate appropriate comments coming from you. I think these are very appropriate. And the, the, um, up, until, up until today, and you said that there was a report two days ago. I have not seen that. It wasn't, it wasn't sent to my office, and I really hope that all the data is there so that our, so that our staff can, can evaluate that. Um, and that, indeed, <laughs> our staff told me that they couldn't even get the PowerPoint presentations from the technical summits. So the CPSC engineers are going ahead with their independent analysis of your representations, but as Commissioner Adler said, they're only in the very preliminary stages and no conclusions have been made. Certainly our staff has not concluded, as Commissioner Adler said, that the shutoff switch is the solution. I fully appreciate now that you have a tremendous advantage here at the commission. Our acting chair was the only chair, who, only commissioner who voted against the NPR, and our new general counsel comes from your industry and fought vociferously against any safety measures. And she's the one who would have to sign off on any mandatory rule. So your request with respect to us backing off on a mandatory rule, I'm sure, is something that during this administration um, you're clearly safe on. Um, but um, I have to say that the UL standard, and I don't know if, uh, if your members, frankly, participated in that standard or not, but I know that um, we, have, we have had radio silence from the chair's office for the first time in my five years of experience about the voluntary standard that was passed by UL in terms of supporting that and congratulations. So I just, I feel the need to point out several of the things that were in your presentation both written and oral, that are simply not the case. Because I think it's so important that this agency it continue to work on making portable generators safer. As I said, staff has not concluded that the appropriate approach is a shutoff switch. Um, and you, it is not, you represented that your standard's been proven effective. It can't be proven effective if our, if our staff engineers haven't had a chance to look at all the data to determine that that could be an effective approach. And your statement that compliance has been demonstrated, it's not even going to go into effect for two years. So that's clearly not true. And in response to the questions with respect to the 99%, which uh, our, our acting chair misstated as you saying it was an effective rate of 99%. And in fairness to you, that's not what is stated. What's stated is the new standard would, and I quote, address 99% of CO-related fatalities resulting from misuse of portable generators where CO can accumulate. And then you favorably compare that to the CPSC's 42%. Um, I, but there are several things that are missing there, and there are subsets there. I don't know how misuse is defined, since I've never heard a portable generator manufacturer ever say that any death resulted from anything other than misuse. I don't know if it includes outdoor use, because I, I, I'll tell you, I was particularly struck with looking at a photo of a man who died, and his generator was outside and his garage door was open only far enough to let the cord through, and he still died from the carbon monoxide. And there's a further subset of where CO can accumulate. So until our staff has had a chance to really look at this, um, I, as you know from my representations to you in Wisconsin and since then, I really, really hope you've found the answer. But to represent that our staff thinks that's the answer so prematurely is not accurate. Thank you. Again, I want to remind my colleagues we're here to listen to the public and to their comments and opinions and not to accuse them of, of, uh, of misstating uh, the truth. Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Um, Mrs. Dorich, thank you for coming in and for presenting an issue that I don't recall during my time at the commission where it's been so localized. I know Commissioner Adler asked about whether it was other airports, and I think that's an important question, but to me, this is squarely something that the agency should be working on. So I thank you for bringing it to our attention. I, when I had read your written submission that came in a couple of weeks ago, I'd already raised it with our compliance staff and asked them to take a look at it. Obviously, I'm not the chair anymore, as I was during the lumber liquidator's time, in which I could direct staff as opposed to asking them to run it to ground. But my hope is that the agency will do its part. This is why you have a federal government. This is why you pay taxes as we had to do with lumber liquidators. I don't know if we could do this alone. We might have to include ATSDR, CDC. It sounds like FAA might have a component, at least from a funding perspective. They might bear some responsibility, but I do think that this is something the agency should work on. I know that we talked before this as I was making my way through the panel, and you mentioned that you had been in touch with our staff. So my hope is that the agency will take it seriously we'll work on it and these are very challenging issues they're expensive they take a lot of time to test and as you mentioned it's difficult sometimes to isolate the cause and then to tie that back to the health effects but the fact that it's challenging in my mind doesn't mean we shouldn't do it we have a responsibility to do it and i hope you'll stay on it and keep us honest on this issue well, we're doing our very best you know the, this is so complicated and so far reaching i mean I didn't even touch on how it impacts our home values. You know, I can't sell my house unless I disclose I have these windows. So what is that going to mean? Does that mean I have to make a concession on the sell price of my home? Who even knows if somebody wants to live there knowing those windows were there? And we're talking 20,000 properties. That's mind-blowing, billions of dollars. Yeah. And, and, and people that have come and gone on out of these homes don't even know they were exposed or what they were exposed to. And it goes to a lot of what uh, Dr. Zuckerberg was talking or about um, with regard to phthalates. I have a lot of concerns about the phthalates that might be coming off the PVC. And the worst offending window is in my son, 17-year-old son's bedroom. He's been in that room since 2005. And... He has ADHD. He has obesity issues. You know, this can cause him to have low sperm count. Is he going to be able to have children? It, we're scared to death. We truly, truly are. And this is moving at a snail's pace. And not only that, and I hate to say it because I'm not a conspiracy theorist at all, but it smacks of a cover-up. Somebody, they've known about this for a long time. If they've confirmed windows that go back as far as 1998, you cannot make me believe that they have not known and what was going on and to pull out windows um, without any kind of correct, I understand a quality policy. Anybody that manages $550 million and touches as many homes as they do, there's no way they don't have a quality policy in place. Uh, to treat this as an anomaly was ridiculous because if you understand manufacturing, you know that the products that were used in my windows were used in anybody else's windows in 2011. But now that we have 10 years or, or more of, that have been affected, that have been confirmed as having this smell, that is extremely scary. And why only Chicago? I don't know. Yep. You know? Well, again, hopefully that's something that we We, we, we really can hope on. that between the ATSDR and the Consumer Product Safety Commission and the Illinois Department of Health and all of the attorney generals that we're also going to turn to on this, that we get to the bottom of this a lot faster than the 10 years that the CDA thinks it's going to take to replace all these windows. So thank you so much. Sure. Well, my office and I will do our part. I do think it's interesting that one of the issues that you raised at least in brief, was that there might actually be a mechanical hazard as well. And oh, so there is a I think that that's hazard. an important area for our staff to evaluate. And my hope is that the chairman will, as I did with lum the lumber liquidators case, will give the staff the direction that they need to work on this. So thank you for bringing it to our thank attention. You. Uh, for the remaining panelists, other than Ms. McGee, we've obviously had many conversations over the years about these issues. And so I just do want to spend my remaining time with Ms. McGee. And um, you know, I think to to come in here and to talk about these issues after what you've gone through, and certainly two years ago, three years ago, you never could have imagined that this is where you would be spending today and this is what you would be doing and why you would be doing it. I think that uh, while it's all well and good to thank you for coming, I think you're actually, you're owed a lot more than that. I really do. And first of all, I think that you're owed an apology. And 
as the chairman at the time of the of, at the agency at the time when we did the first recall, even though we made the best decision that I think we could have made, others might disagree, but we made the best decision that we could have made and we gave it our best efforts, it wasn't good enough. And for that, I'm sorry. And the buck stopped with me as the chairman. And so I'm apologizing to you for my failure that our best efforts were not good enough. And even beyond that, I think you're owed our continued best efforts. And I have to say that, unfortunately, in the last year plus, I don't see us continuing with our best efforts. And you mentioned a bunch of different factors that are involved. There's the voluntary standards effort. And there's a difference between the staff going in there without any cover and advocating as best as they could but not being supported by the agency leadership. I think they deserve more support. I don't think they're actually asking for a lot. I think they're being reasonable. They're asking for the 50-pound limit to go to 60-pound limits. The irony, of course, in that is that that actually makes the standard truer to what's currently written in the standard. It's supposed to cover the 95th percentile up to age five kids. It doesn't. Getting to 60 pounds would actually do that. So that's not really changing the standard. It's just making it more honest of what's on paper. I don't think that's a big ask. I think Consumer Reports did a phenomenal job of demonstrating, as you pointed out, that many companies are already doing this. And so I don't think that's a very big ask. And I don't think it's a lot for the leadership of the agency to backstep on that, but they're not. It's not happening right now, and that's not our best efforts. Our best efforts also include, as you mentioned, a mandatory standard. It's taken a lot. It was a lot of effort while I was chair to start the process. It was not unanimously something that people supported early on. It did get a unanimous vote. But I'm not seeing a best efforts approach to urge staff to move that along as quickly as possible and to make that a top priority. I think we should be doing that. And I'd like to see the staff do that. I don't think it takes much to go from an ANPR to an NPR. I realize that's somewhat inside baseball talk, but really from phase one to phase two, I don't think it's that complicated an issue. We've been studying this long and that we have this much data on, and I would like to see us do that quickly. And I think it's fair for you to expect us to do that. That's part of our best efforts. And even on the education side, Education, as Commissioner Adler mentioned, has a role to play. Unfortunately, it gets overblown a lot, and I thought that you actually captured it best of anybody I've ever heard come before the commission. Why should something be sold incomplete that requires the consumer to actually finish the job? That was phenomenally put. And that's the frustration that I've had with the education campaigns is that it offloads to the consumer responsibility that I don't think is fair. And I'm a parent of young children. And even with what I know, I have a hard time keeping up with all the safety things that need to be done in a household. And so on education campaigns, one of the things that some of us have tried to push is, and Ms. Coles mentioned this, is an evaluation component. We spent a lot of money for this agency on education campaigns without having any idea whether it works or not. And it's been difficult to get the agency to focus on actually studying our campaigns to see if they work and making sure that the money we spent is well spent. And I think our best efforts would be making a bigger priority of that effort. And so it's, well, it's great to thank you for coming here. What matters in the long term is what we do from here on out and whether we continue to apply ourselves. And I hope that you'll continue to push us and I'll say this to Lisa as well and to all the rest of the parents, especially, because you bear a special burden of holding our feet to the fire. And it's important for us to make sure that we're doing everything we can, that we come in every day and stay true to the agency's mission. And so thank you for coming in, but I think you deserve more than that. And you have my commitment to continue to do my part with our best efforts. Thank you. You completed your questions. I have no more questions. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, we will now take, uh, let me begin by saying thank you again to all of you um, for your time here today. And we will now take a five minute break to transition to panel number two. Thank you again for being here. Thank you. Welcome back. We will now resume with our second panel, which includes Ms. Rachel Weintraub, Consumer Federation of America, 
Ms. Kristen Kern, the American Apparel and Footwear Association, Dr. Sarah Denny, the American Academy of Pediatrics, Ms. Jennifer Cleary, the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers, and Ms. Eve Gardner from Earth Justice. Welcome to all of you. We look forward to hearing your testimony. You may begin, Ms. Weintraub. Thank you. Acting Chairman Burkle and Commissioners, I appreciate the opportunity to provide comments on CPSC's FY 2019 and 2020 priorities on behalf of Consumer Federation of America. I'm Rachel Weintraub, CFA's Legislative Director and General Counsel. The CPSC is an incredibly important agency. Its mission impacts every American every day to protect the public from unreasonable risks of injury or death associated from the use of consumer products. The CPSC has numerous tools to fulfill this mission, and all of these tools must be used to effectively protect consumers. The CPSC's mission relies upon agency action to issue, for example, mandatory standards, assess civil and criminal penalties, work on voluntary standards, conduct recalls, and educate consumers. It is imperative for consumers and for the regulated community that CPSC's laws are enforced rigorously and consistently and that all of the tools Congress gave the CPSC are used. My focus today focuses on key product safety issues and really summarize my written testimony. The CPSC is aware of 335 deaths and 506 injuries related to recreational off-highway vehicle crashes from January 2003 to April 2013. My organization and its partners document fatalities, and we documented 499 fatalities between January 1, 2013 and March of this year. We documented 130 fatalities in 2017, which is the highest annual fatality count to date. CFA also completed an analysis of OHV recalls and found that over the past eight years that the highest number of recalls occurred during the past three years and 2017 had the most recalls. We urged the CPSC to immediately investigate this increase in OHV recalls. Second, we are concerned about the failure to act on known OHV fire hazards quickly and effectively. On December 19, 2017, the CPSC in Polaris, for example, issued a short statement about Polaris RZR 900s and 1000 ROVs and particular fire risks. But at that time, there was not complete information for consumers to take. We applaud the recall of RZR XP 1000s. However, the RZR 900s not, were not part of that recall, and the recall focused on one specific hazard. This still leaves some consumers without enough information to protect themselves. We appreciate the record $27.25 million civil penalty assessed against Polaris for failing to report defective ROVs to the CPSC. It's imperative that the CPSC hold entities responsible for egregious conduct. We also understand that an important lawsuit was filed last week seeking to hold Polaris accountable for defects that cause fires, and we hope that this can shed more light on the fire risk. The voluntary standards for these vehicles must be updated to address fire hazards, and we urge the CPSC to issue injury and fatality statistics for ROVs annually. This past January, a new version of the window covering voluntary standard was approved that will require stock products, some products, to be cordless. This was an achievement. However, much more work must be done to prevent strangulation hazards posed by corded window coverings since approximately 11 children die and 80 children are treated for entanglement and near fatal injuries every single year. And the standard does not address window coverings already in homes. We are concerned that non-compliant products could be sold online and that hazardous corded stock inventory will be liquidated throughout this year. The CPSC, the WCMA, and others must affirmatively educate consumers about the strangulation risks corded window coverings pose. Further, the CPSC should monitor the marketplace to ensure that the voluntary standard did not create loopholes allowing for more products to in fact have cords. A mandatory standard is necessary to make operating cords for all window coverings inaccessible. 
On flame retardants in consumer products, we appreciate that the CPSC voted to move forward on our, organo, our, on our organo halogen, halogen petition. We applaud the commission wor for working to convene the CHAP, and we urge the agency to move forward in that process as quickly as possible. We also applaud the CPSC's issuance of a guidance document on the flame retardants as used in children's products, upholstered furniture, mattresses, and electronic casings. On recall effectiveness, the vast majority of consumers who own a recalled product never find out about the recall. This means that some unsafe products remain unwittingly in homes. We appreciate that notes from last summer's recall meeting were recently made available and that the CPSC held that meeting. We agree with how the workshop report characterized the stakeholder suggestions. We urge the CPSC and others to explore ways to increase direct notice to consumers, expand the use of marketing strategies and technology, consider consumer and business incentives, and disseminate additional information on best practices, as well as to finalize the voluntary recall rule. Another high priority for the CPSC should be saferproducts.gov. 35,640 reports have been posted to saferproducts.gov, and it continues to be an important tool for consumers, researchers, doctors, consumers, and the CPSC. Based on our analysis from November 2016, we recommend that the CPSC continue to explore how to make this database even more useful and accessible, including increasing promotion of the site, expanding the data sources included in saferproducts.gov, releasing reports on data trends, and improving data co categories and searchability. On CPSIA implementation, because of these rules promulgated under the CPSIA, 19 infant durable products must now meet robust mandatory standards. The 2011 CRIB standard, for example, is the strongest CRIB standard in the world. We urge the CPSC to continue to commit the staff time and resources to prioritize these rules and to add additional products under Section 104. Regarding high-powered magnets, the United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit decision struck down the CPSC's high-power magnet set rule that we supported strongly. More rare earth magnets are entering the market, creating hazards that could severely injure or kill children. We urge the CPSC to take strong action to educate the public about these hazards and to reissue the rule. On all-terrain vehicles, according to the most recent data from the CPSC, at least 101,200 people were injured while riding all-terrain vehicles in 2016. The estimated number of ATV-related fatalities was 647 for 2015, which included at least 53 children under the age of 16. The CPSC must prioritize this issue. We urge the agency to complete the ATV rulemaking, which should also analyze the hazards posed to children, the adequacy of ATV safety, safety and training materials, efforts to ensure that children are not riding inappropriate ATVs. OHV operation on roads is growing and we urge the agency to prioritize its opposition of operating OHVs on roads and educate consumers about the dangers of on-road OHV use. On furniture tipovers, there's not much more I could add to what Janet McGee so effectively and articulately stated. I would only add that much more needs to be done to improve the voluntary standard. We, we support the CPSC's ANPR and believe that the mandatory standard that is stronger than the current voluntary standard is necessary. On laundry packets, highly concentrated laundry detergent packets can pose a serious risk of injury to children and to older adults. We support strengthening the voluntary standard to require individually wrapped packets, requirements for the design, color, and ingredients as well. We urge the CPSC to be fully engaged in this standards process, monitor the incident data, and move forward with an effective mandatory standard if in fact the voluntary standard is not proving effective. In conclusion, the CPSC plays a critical role in ensuring consumers are safe from product hazards. We urge the CPSC to use its enforcement tools to protect consumers, and we look forward to working with you to achieve these goals. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. Ms. Kern. Thank you. 
Acting Chairman Burkle, Commissioners, thank you for holding today's hearing and providing this forum for constructive dialogue. On behalf of the American Apparel and Footwear Association, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today regarding the Commission's agenda and priorities for fiscal years 2019 and 2020. AAFA is the National Trade Association representing apparel, footwear, travel goods, and other sewn products companies and their suppliers, which compete in the global market. We're proud of the open and collaborative relationship that we share with the Commission. Many of our members are engaged in the production and sale of children's clothing and footwear, so we're on the front lines of product safety. It is our members who design and execute the quality and compliance programs that stitch product safety into every garment and shoe that we make. To support our members in this effort, AAFA has taken the lead in educating our industry on the development, interpretation, and implementation of product safety standards and regulations. The priorities that we hope the Commission will adopt as, are as follows. Reducing testing and regulatory burdens associated with spandex. Last year, we began working with the Commission to review the testing burdens associated with testing spandex to meet the requirements of the Flammable Fabrics Act, 16 CFR 1610. Section D2 of 16 CFR 1610 exempts fabrics regardless of weight made entirely from or from a combination of six types of fibers. The exemption, however, does not include spandex, even though spandex blend garments consistently pass flammability tests. AAFA <laughs> compiled results from spandex flammability testing and provided findings to the Commission to discuss exempting spandex from current testing standards. We appreciate the Commission's willingness to work with us thus far on reviewing the addition of spandex to the exempt fibers list, and we hope that the Commission will prioritize continuing this effort to reduce testing burdens for companies without compromising product safety. Working to harmonize um, product safety regulations. We need to make sure that individual states and countries have a common approach to product safety. This is currently not the case. The proliferation of conflicting and contradictory product safety standards are among the uh, biggest product safety challenges of our time. We believe that the Commission has tools through which it can foster a more unified national and international approach to product safety. We hope that the Commission can focus some of its resources on this priority issue. Building Industry Commission Collaboration. We want to stress the importance of the Commission using AAFA as well as other associations as a resource when developing not only standards but guidance documents and educational events. We believe that this, it is integral to our mission to educate the industry on its domestic and international product safety compliance obligations. AAFA and its members truly appreciate the opportunity to work with the Commission and we look forward to continuing that relationship through fiscal years 2019 and 2020 and beyond. In conclusion, we're delighted to have a positive relationship with the Commission and we believe that there are many opportunities for further collaboration. We look forward to working with the Commission to reduce testing and regulatory burdens, harmonize the product safety approach between states and abroad, and build collaboration between the industry and the Commission for the benefit of consumer product safety. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Denny. Okay, thanks. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Sarah Denny. I'm a pediatrician in Columbus, Ohio, where I work in a pediatric emergency department. I'm here today on behalf of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, I sit on the executive committee for the Council on Injury Violence and Poison Prevention for the AAP, and I very much appreciate this opportunity to make recommendations to you about what the Academy feels um, CPSC should prioritize in the next two fiscal years. Um, I know we've already talked a bit about safe sleep. I'm going to talk about it again because it's one of our biggest priority areas. Um, the AAP appreciates the CPSC's ongoing work to promote safe sleep, but as you know, much work still needs to be done to reduce our country's high incidence of sudden unexplained infant death, or SUID. Uh, the CDC found that in 2015, there are approximately 3,700 SUID deaths in the United States. That's a baby dying every two and a half hours from SUID. There's a study published uh, in February of this year in pediatrics that found there have been sharp declines in the rates of SIDS, or sudden infant death syndrome, since the 1990s. And this is associated with those national efforts that you're aware of about the back to sleep campaign, um, most notably. But while the rate of SIDS has decreased, the bad news is, is there's been a remarkable lack of progress in decreasing sewage deaths in the last two decades. So just to kind of clarify in the terminology, because I feel like it gets very complicated with sewage and SIDS and what all this means, um, 
Suid is an umbrella term, and that describes deaths due to SIDS, also asphyxiation, strangulation, and suffocation, as well as unknown causes. So there's been a diagnostic shift of cor as coroners are going out and doing more death scene investigations, they are coding less of these cases as SIDS and more um, related to the sleep environment or asphyxiation and that kind of thing. Um, so suid deaths, the majority of which happen in the first six months of life, remain stubbornly high. We can and must do more to prevent the thousands of safe sleep deaths that still occur every year. The CPSC is in a unique position to help address the public health problem of SUID through its jurisdiction over infant products, as well as opportunities to communicate to families, caregivers, and healthcare providers. However, current efforts to promote safe sleep are not reducing deaths, especially in the high-risk populations. This is an issue desperately in need of new approaches. In addition, CPSC can and should strengthen its safe sleep messaging by banning crib bumpers. We're eager to learn the status of the CPSC staff work to develop a performance standard for crib bumpers and urge you not to slow this work down. There's no evidence that bumper pads prevent injuries, but there's significant potential risk for suffocation, strangulation, or entrapment. We'd also urge CPSC to pay attention to the open safety questions regarding the baby boxes. There's insufficient data right now on what the role is for these cardboard boxes. Currently, there are randomized control trials being conducted in New Zealand and Australia, but there's nothing that's been published yet. Uh, further, the AAP supports a ban on supplemental mattresses and play yards with non-rigid sides. Um, as you know, these have no place in a safe sleep environment. They pose a risk for suffocation hazard in infants, and we're pleased to see legislation banning them in New Jersey. Regulatory actions, investigation of optimal safe sleep messaging, and sustained public health communication can be central to CPSC's efforts to address sewage. Next, I'd like to address um, liquid laundry detergent packets. Uh, reducing child exposures to liquid laundry, det laundry detergent packets remains a priority for the Academy. The AAPs participated in the ASTM process to improve the safety of these products, and we're glad to see the ASTM F3159-15 voluntary standards published in 2015. But we're concerned that the ASTM subcommittee's work to track efficacy of the voluntary standard will use inappropriate metrics. Specifically, we're concerned that some of the stakeholders who are, pers are pursuing the use of an in inappropriate denominator to determine the effectiveness of the ASTM voluntary standard in reducing harm to children from these packets. The appropriate way to use the public health approach is assessing the standard's efficacy is to calculate the incidence rate of packet exposures by dividing the number of exposures of, to the packets by the number of individuals at risk of the exposure. However, despite our suggestions, the group is still considering dividing the number of exposures by the number of products sold, a number which is growing every year and which is not a public health-based measure. We're concerned that such a metric could falsely make it appear that the ASTM standard is more effective than it actually is by masking an unacceptably high child exposure rate. The equivalent of this is trying to demonstrate the effectiveness of an intervention to a Zika-related disease by measuring the number of Zika cases divided by the mosquito population. We urge CPSC to stay engaged in the ASTM process and ensure follow-up of the implementation of the, that the standard occurs. Appropriate metrics are used to evaluate effectiveness and that meaningful decreases in exposures and exposure rates occur. Just touching briefly on liquid nicotine, uh, the AAP strongly supported the enactment of the Child Nicotine Poisoning Prevention Act of 2015, which requires CPSC to enforce the mandatory child-resistant packaging material. However, the AAP continues to find examples of non-compliant products available for sale, both in vape shops and online. Um, we've shared the details of these products already with the Commission. Um, we feel that CPSC should do more to ensure that manufacturers are aware of and complying with the Child Nicotine Poisoning Prevention Act. I'm going to talk briefly about window coverings. I know you guys hear a lot about that topic um, at this hearing, but there is some new data that I wanted to share with you today. Window cord coverings prevent an avoid avoidable home hazard. Infants and toddlers near a window can grab the pull cords and become entangled. Just in um, December of 2017, a study was published in Pediatrics, found that from 1990 to 2015, there was an estimated 16,827 window blind related injuries among kids younger than six years. These are kids who are treated in emergency departments in the United States, um, giving you an injury rate of about 2.7 per 100,000 children. 
This is likely an underestimation because it doesn't take into account those children who are seeking care at their primary care physicians or those who are not seeking treatment at all. The most common mechanism of injury is the struck by, which was 48.8%. Entanglement injuries accounted for 11.9% of all cases among, and among the subgroup, 98.9 involved the blind cords. Overall, most injuries, 93.4, were treated and released. Um, this data came from the CPSC's National Electronic Injury Surveillance System and the in-depth investigation databases um, retrospectively analyzed. In the IDI reports from 1996 to 2012, researchers identified 231 window blind cord entanglements incidents in kids less than six years of age. 98.7 of those involved the child's neck. Two-thirds of entanglement incidents included in the IDI database resulted in death. So, Although many of these injuries were non-fatal and resulted in mild injuries, um, cases involving window blind cord entanglements frequently resulted in hospitalization or death. A mandatory safety standard that eliminates accessible blind cords should be adopted. The AP was glad to see the mo movement last year um, on the voluntary standard recommending cordless window blinds for all stock products. Um, this represents a long overdue step forward by the industry. However, uh, the Academy feels that CPSC should also apply this safety standard to custom blinds as well um, and to make this voluntary standard a mandatory one. A mandatory standard prohibiting accessible window covering cords is the only way to ensure that all kids are protected from this avoidable hazard in all homes going forward. For example, currently the voluntary standard will have no effect on rental units um, in which tenants are unable to change out the, the window coverings in their unit and then putting those children at risk. Contrary to misleading statements in the press, voluntary standards are not the same as mandatory standards and we expect CPSC to acknowledge this fact when its representatives speak to the press. Uh, recreational off-highway off vehicles and all-train vehicles, I know Rachel already touched on this briefly. Um, from the pediatric perspective, we continue to see tragedies and disabilities that result from children on uh, rec the ROVs and the ATVs. Kids are not developmentally ready um, to operate these heavy, complex machines, and no child under the age of 16 should be operating an ROV or ATV. Children should not even be passengers um, on ROVs or ATVs, but despite our best efforts to educate um, and prevent children's use of these machines, children continue to suffer injuries and deaths. Um, we want to do more to prevent these injuries, and we applaud the CPSC for its recent levying of a meaningful civil penalty against Polaris for failing to report its defective ROVs to the C CPSC as required by law. Um, the CPSC is an important agency whose work impacts the lives of infants and children every day, and we very much appreciate that. We urge the Commission, as it moves forward into the next fiscal year, to prioritize work on these issues and products laid out herein. We're grateful for the opportunity to comment and look forward to assisting the Commission in protecting the health of all children. Thank you very much, Dr. Denny. Ms. Cleary? Thank you so much for allowing me to be here today to share uh, my comments on the Commission's budget and priorities for 2019 and 2020. I'm Jennifer Cleary, the Senior Director of Regulatory Affairs with the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers, or AHAM. Um, AHAM represents manufacturers of major portable and floor care home appliances and suppliers to the industry. Our members' top priority is to design products that are as safe as they are useful. AHAM safety standards activities are aimed at developing, evaluating, and commenting on proposals from S uh, SDOs such as UL and CSA. We have made and supported a significant number of safety proposals, almost 70 uh, for major and portable appliances in the past six years. Today I'd like to touch briefly on four topics, uh, water, counterfeit water filters for refrigerators, the Refrigerator Safety Act, voluntary standards and joint research, and the Internet of Things. Uh, first on counterfeit water filters for refrigerators. Counterfeit and deceptively labeled water filters are sold online every day. Consumers are purchasing these thinking that they're buying a genuine filter to mitigate their concerns about drinking water, which in many places in the U.S. Uh, contains impurities such as lead. Genuine filters remove these harmful contaminants. Counterfeit products do not. In response, as you know, AHIM has developed a public information campaign through our website, filteritout.org, and other means uh, on the existence of the dangers associated with counterfeit water filters for refrigerators. Our goal has been to raise awareness and to give consumers a trusted source to purchase a genuine product. 
We've also been regularly meeting with the commission on this issue and most recently we met with each of you to present our data demonstrating that counterfeit water filters are not only not removing contaminants but in many cases adding contaminants to the water. Um, we also have a meeting planned to meet with staff as well on this issue. And I know we owe you some follow-up from our recent meetings with you. Um, in addition, we've been meeting with the CBP and the IPR Center to begin work to get these counterfeit products out of consumers' hands. As we've shared with you, our goal is to work with you to stop these products at the border by elevating this to a health and safety risk and to get the message out to a broader group of consumers. We appreciate the interest that you have shown in working with us on this issue, and we respectfully ask that you include this as a priority in the budget for 2019 and 2020, as this is a complicated issue which will no doubt take time to address. Moving to the Refrigerator Safety Act. Because the old Refrigerator Safety Act, in order to prevent refrigerators with latches or similar closures, requires refrigerators to be opened from the inside, manufacturers must file general certificates of conformity certifying that refrigerators comply with their requirements of the Act. Modern refrigerators do not have latches, and the current UL safety standard, in a more modern manner, requires refrigerators to be opened from the inside. Thus, GCCs are a wasteful paperwork exercise at this point that do not protect the public, but are burdensome for manufacturers. Manufacturers are often listing all of the models that comply, which is all of their refrigerator models, uh, on a single label to most efficiently comply with the GCC requirement. But this means that when new models are added or when models are changed, the label must be changed, the old one's discarded, new one's affixed to the product, um, which, so this constant monitoring and changing of labels is adding considerable cost and burden uh, with no corresponding safety benefit. So as part of CPSC's retroactive review, AHAM respectfully requests that the Commission include this in its priorities so that we can work together to mitigate the burden associated with this outdated law. Specifically, we think that the Commission could change its rules to recognize the existence of the safety certification mark uh, to stand in the place of the GCC. Alternatively, the Commission could expressly indicate in writing that it will not enforce the requirement for a GCC for refrigerators so long as the refrigerator bears the safety certification mark. These changes would not represent any change in safety for the consumer, but they would have an enormous and helpful impact for manufacturers. Third, I'd like to address a partnership on voluntary standards and on joint research with the Commission. We regularly work with CPSC staff on voluntary safety standards and we're glad to see continued commitment to participation on voluntary safety standards committees and task forces. The participation of CPSC staff has been critical in a number of areas and products. Um, we also successfully collaborate on many issues with CPSC staff to inform proposals that AHAM is making to UL and CSA. And as I mentioned, we've been prolific with almost 70 standards for, for uh, 70 proposals to UL and CSA for portable and major appliances in the past six years. We thank the staff for their continued and coordinated work with us, and we seek the Commission's continued support for these important efforts which effectively and efficiently advance a number of product safety issues. Um, these could include joint research projects, we ha which we haven't done in, in a little bit of time, to address knowledge gaps before moving to develop tests. Um, we don't have specific projects to propose at this time, but we do have a few um, that we think could be possibilities in the next couple of years, and so we'd like to ask for room in the budget to, to address those together. Um, finally, on the Internet of Things, we thank the Commission for the IoT notice that was uh, published in the Federal Register and we'll be glad to provide our input on that in the coming month or two. Um, this is certainly a complicated issue to say the least um, that will require feedback from a variety of stakeholders and thoughtful leadership from CPSC staff and the Commission to ensure that consumers are protected but also able to enjoy the benefits from the innovation associated with these products. Thank you again for allowing me to provide my feedback today. Thank you very much, Ms. Gartner. Thank you, <clears throat> Chairman Burkle and commissioners. And thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you today. I am Eve Gartner from Earth Justice, along with Rachel Weintraub at the other end of this table. I represent the organizations that petitioned the commission to ban the sale 
of four categories of consumer products containing additive non-polymeric organohalogen flame retardants as a class. My clients, who include the International Association of Firefighters, the American Academy of Pediatrics, National Hispanic Medical Association, the American Medical Women's Association, Consumers Union, Green Science Policy Institute, Learning Disabilities Association of America, and others, thank the Commission very much for its votes last year to grant our petition and to ask the National Academies to convene a chronic hazard advisory panel. Chronic, yes. It's chronic, yes. We also thank the Commission for its guidance publication, which offers an important warning to manufacturers, retailers, and consumers about the hazards of organohalogen flame retardants as a class and additive form. Getting additive organohalogens out of consumer products will have very meaningful health benefits for virtually everyone who lives in this country, and especially for children. We urge the Commission to make this rulemaking a priority over the next two fiscal years and to move forward with completing the rulemaking as expeditiously as possible. We also urge the Commission to continue to publicize its guidance document so that retailers and consumers in particular are aware of the safety concerns that this Commission has flagged. I would also note that the petitioners would very much welcome periodic status updates from the Commission on the CHAP process and its timeline. I also want to urge the Commission to move forward with adopting California TB117 2013, the furniture flammability standard that was adopted in California several years ago as a national furniture flammability standard. This standard offers important protection against smoldering sources, which are the most significant sources of furniture fires. And one of the key things about this California standard is it can be met without the use of additive flame retardant chemicals. There is wide support for this standard among firefighters, among furniture manufacturers, and among public health advocates and scientists. scientists. So adopting it as a national standard should be a no-brainer for this commission. We urge the commission to move forward with this in the coming fiscal years. As a corollary to that, it is imperative that CPSC not itself adopt any furniture flammability standard that would, as a practical matter, result in use of any chemical flame retardant chemicals. Uh, chemicals that are replacements for organohalogens also have been found to present serious risks, risks of harm. So simply banning products with organohalogens isn't a complete solution to this problem. We have to stop creating a demand for flame retardant chemicals in furniture. And the answer is a, a national furniture flammability standard that protects against the most common sources of fires but doesn't require the use of added chemicals. Um, and there are many ways to protect consumers from furniture fires. Smoke, in addition to the TB117 2013 standard, smoke detectors, fire safety education, and sprinklers are very effective methods of protecting people from fires and don't harm human health or our ecosystems. Um, just historically, I think we all acknowledge that it was a major mistake to add toxic flame retardants to our furniture for decades as a way to reduce the very small number of open flame furniture related fire deaths. We recklessly added a carcinogen, the flame retardant Penta BDE, to our nation's furniture for decades. Um, and we are paying the consequences. This has limited our children's IQs. It's, it's impaired their, um, their ability to learn. And um, it's caused a range of other health problems across the population, and that's been documented in human health studies. Safer, non-chemical prevention methods are available. We should not continue to repeat the same mistake with another generation of toxic chemicals. So we strongly urge CPSC not to adopt any open flame flammability standard for furniture and to go forward with the TB117 2013 smoldering standard as a national standard. 
Thank you again for all you are doing to protect consumers by ensuring that consumer products are fire safe and that they do not contain unnecessary additive toxic chemicals. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you again to all of our panelists. We will now begin our commission 10-minute round, uh, 10 minute rounds of questions, and I will begin the, the questions. Uh, Ms. Weintraub, I wanted to um, just talk to you a little bit about the Anchor It campaign, and I appreciate your support for the campaign, and, and I see it as one prong of, of a campaign to, to help eliminate deaths from tip-overs. Can you perhaps shed some light on how you think we could make that campaign more effective. You heard from the first panel that maybe the message isn't getting out there. How can we ramp that up? So, um, Because if we strengthen the standard, if we pass a mandatory standard, regardless of those two efforts, there are still millions and millions of dressers out there that we need to let the parents be made aware of so that we can avoid any... Uh, catastrophes or uh, tragedies in their homes. So could you maybe speak to that a little bit? Sure. Um, thank you very much for the question. I think sort of similar to the Safe, safe Sleep campaign, Anchor It is, is rather complicated for American consumers. Um, first, um, the studies that I've seen is that Americans overwhelmingly do not anchor their furniture to the wall. It's something that culturally um, Americans do not do um, extensively. There are numerous reasons for that. Um, I think um, Ms. McGee, first of all, articulated it so well, as Co Commissioner Kay mentioned, in terms of, you know, products need to be stable before they're sold, and it shouldn't be up to consumers to finish the job. Um, but because there are so many pieces of furniture that are unstable, um, there certainly is a lot of education that needs to happen. So I think, number one, it's complicated because American consumers um, don't routinely attach their furniture to the wall. There are some consumers that cannot because they live in specific properties that don't allow it. Second, I think it's really important with all consumers consumer edu campaign, education campaigns to evaluate it. Um, is it working? Is it not working? Is it changing behavior? Who, how many people are being reached by it? Um, and is it having the attended effect? So I think those types of evaluations are incredibly important. Um, I do think that while education is incredibly important because even if a stronger mandatory standard does eventually go into effect to make furniture inherently stable, which is our desire, we still have the issue of all of the products in consumers' homes. So communicating with consumers, making sure that they are in fact getting the message is something that we all need to do a much um, more effective job with. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Gardner, I agree with your petition or your position about the adoption of TB 117 as a national standard. I tried to get my colleagues to support that position, and unfortunately I couldn't. Um, but I would like to ask you, um, what is the basis for um, that approach, and maybe just elaborate on that a little bit. Well, that approach has been in place in California now, for several years, and I, I think that um, it's, it's still a bit early to, to have clear studies um, showing, showing the impact of it, but I think it's, it's clear that there certainly has been no increase in fire-related um, deaths or, or injuries um, since that standard went into effect. Um, and there has been a fairly dramatic uh, reduction in the uh, use of flame retardants, toxic flame retardants in furniture, though um, they're still finding about 20 to 25 percent of the furniture sold in California still does contain flame retardants, which is part of why you know we think our petition to ban the organohalogen flame retardants is still highly relevant. Um, but but they they're finding that to be an effective approach in California, which is obviously a very significant furniture market. Thank you very much, um, Miss Clary. The um, counterfeit water filters. I want first of all I want to thank you. We we have our regular meetings with AHAM, and in our last meeting we talked about 
the campaign that you referred to, the educational campaign about letting consumers be aware of the fact that there are these counterfeit uh, water filters out there, and not only do they not do what they're supposed to do, but I think your testimony and, and the meeting it and the data that you provided indicates that they not only not take out uh, possible toxins, but they also may may put some in the water. So um, I'll look forward to receiving that, that information about an educational campaign and see if we can't do partner, at least help you get the message out through our agency. But I think consumer awareness is a big piece of this. And again, I want to thank AHAM uh, for the collaborative efforts with our staff. I know that they value the meetings and the information that's shared and look forward to continuing that. Um, Dr. Denny, I um, appreciate your remarks about safe sleep, and I asked in the first panel from Ms. Coles um, from Kids in Danger, same question. It's a complicated message, um, and I'm wondering how we can simplify that message, how we can be uh, united in that message, and so the consumer isn't confused. And if you have any insights on that, I would appreciate hearing that. those. Thank you for the question. Um, as far as the message, you're right, it is such a complicated issue, and we're struggling, you know, on the medical side to figure out how to do it. And I think the overall message um, that a lot of us are using, I would say, not just within medicine, um, but also the health departments, um, Cribs for Kids, like all these different organizations are using the ABCs of safe sleep. So that really seems to be the standardized kind of message that we're trying to promote. But the other thing that we're realizing within our own community is it's not one size fits all. You know, sometimes parents sleep with their kids for different reasons. Um, you know, one of the new issues that's just coming up in this past year is with all the housing insecurity. Now there's air mattresses and we're seeing deaths related to air mattresses. That wasn't an issue that I knew of two years ago when I sat before um, the commission. And so, you know, what we're doing in the pediatrician's office is really trying to get to the specific barriers to safe sleep with the families. Um, and I know that's not as much um, kind of a your area of what you guys are doing, but I think that um, as one of the other panelists had recommended, you know, when a new parent or an expectant family walks into a baby store to do their registry, they assume that everything in that store is safe for their kid because they're selling it in the store. However, we all in this room know that that is not the case. And so, um, me, you know, clarifying about the empty crib, for example, is is critical. I think that they get such mixed messages when they go in these stores and they see all these different apparatuses that they can put their kid in or put in the in the crib with their with their baby, and that that really is confusing. And then we're trying to counteract, you know, that messaging that they're getting when they're in the store with what's really the safest thing for your baby. So I do think that a, the ABCs of safe sleep is the right message, um, but I think that getting down to the next level as to what those barriers are is helpful. And then also on the product side, um, really emphasizing that the empty crib is the best place for the baby to sleep. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the laundry packets, as does Ms. Weintraub, and I think in my time left, if you could each, um, I'll start with Dr. Denny and then, and then to Ms. Weintraub, what do you think the appropriate metrics would be in measuring um, laundry packets and whether or not the voluntary standard is adequate and, and whether it's addressing the hazard? Well, so, I mean, from a, from a public health position, we would want the denominator to be the number of children, not the number of packets. Um, that would be the appropriate. I mean, that's how we measure the incidence of any other injury. I'm not clear as to why a different standard would apply on this particular mechanism. Thank you. And, and I would agree, I think, looking at the rate, as some have proposed, as over the number of products sold is really not the, as I've learned through working very closely with AAP over the years, is not the right um, way to assess a public health measure. Thank you very much. And lastly, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about the baby boxes. That's something our staff is participating in the conversations and the voluntary standards development are your um, are your understanding is there's no research being done here in this in the United States you talked about Australia and New Zealand um, but can you speak to the issue of the baby boxes I know you did in your testimony but the concept seems so popular but 
maybe you could just address it uh, in my short time that's left. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that you are talking about this because I probably, like, you guys are getting weekly calls from the media asking about it, and I don't know what to say. We don't have data. We don't have... Um, we don't know yet. Um, the reason why baby boxes have sort of come into vogue is because Finland gives these baby boxes out and have for extended periods of time, and they have a very low infant mortality rate. So a correlation has been made that the infant mortality rate is low because of the baby boxes. It does not take into account access to health care, smoking, I mean, uh, many, many other factors that we know relates to infant mortality rate. And so, um, you know, all of a sudden, that these baby boxes have really um, gained popularity in the United States. It is true that some families do not have a safe place to put their infant, and so that is a challenge. W where can they put their baby if they can't afford a crib? However, um, in our own hospital, we screen every family in, in our state, it is the law that every family is screened before they leave the birth hospital for a safe, sleep, safe place, and if they don't, one is provided for them with a pack and play or a play yard. Um, every time they come into primary care, they're screened. Every time they come into the emergency department, they're screened, and every time they go to an urgent care, they're screened. The percentage of families, based on our data at our hospital, that actually don't have a safe place to sleep is very low. It's not that they don't have the place, it's that they are not doing a safe sleep environment. Um, so as far as the baby boxes go, I know different health departments are handing them out. Um, I, I believe somewhere in Texas is. I know that there's not any data as far as are they seeing any changes in their infant mortality rate, but I would be really interested if you guys are hearing things um, to keep that dialogue open because the Academy is getting a lot of questions and you have health departments spending a lot of money on this on this piece of equipment that we don't know. Is this helpful? Is this harmful? Is this a good idea? Um, we just don't know. Thank you very much. Commissioner Adler. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and thanks again to the panelists uh, for excellent presentation. Ms. Cleary, um, I'm always struck by one fact, and that is in all the years that the Commission's been around, we have dozens of safety standards for children's products, and that makes sense. They're a vulnerable population. But in all the years the Commission's been in existence, we have promulgated, promulgated a grand total of no safety standards whatsoever for home appliances. Uh, that's not the Commission being derelict. I would suggest so much as that we work cooperatively with the industry, and I really appreciate that. But there is one safety standard, and that's the Refrigerator Safety Act that was enacted by legislation in 1956. Uh, I appreciate the concern your members have about GCCs being expensive and burdensome. I'm not so certain I'm persuaded on the point, but I do have a problem with that. And my problem is, and it's not intuitive unless you go on the Internet and look up retro refrigerators, and what you'll find is there is a huge and robust market for pre-1956 refrigerators. Uh, just yesterday I found out you can, for the modest sum of $3,400, you can buy an original fridge, and one of the things they tout is the pivoting handle, which is the latch on a pre-1956 refrigerator. And my concern is if we were to uh, support the withdrawal of this legislation, that would open the market up to people who want to produce retro refrigerators, more modern, uh, with the pivoting handles. And so I'm curious if you have any concern about this retro market. I'm a, a little unclear. I think, are you speaking firstly of, of products that were manufactured? That's earlier? exactly right. And, and just to be precise, if, if, I make a, if I have a refrigerator that was produced prior to 1956, the commission cannot touch it. Uh, believe me, I've asked. I've said, well, what if they've upgraded it? What if they've retrofitted it to make it look more modern, which is how they're selling them? And at least the report I got from staff was we lacked any jurisdiction to go after these pre-1956 refrigerators. They're still legal to be sold, and they are still being sold. And that's, that's my concern, and I'm wondering if you all have thought about that. And are those subject to the GCC requirement? Uh, they would not be subject to the GCC requirement because they're not subject to the law. So I think that then, uh, under what I was speaking about, we would, you know, it wouldn't apply to those products. So I don't think that's something we've thought about in that context. And any new refrigerators that might be made to mimic that sort of old feel, of course, are subject to the voluntary safety standard. Um, so for the products that are on the market that were manufactured previously, I don't think. 
I, I'm not sure what we could do to address those or if we're seeing deaths that no, are... No, and I, I understand the GCC problem, and it may be solvable with your suggestions. My concern is one way of resolving that that you've raised is to go and abolish, withdraw the law, and that's not something I'm inclined to do, but I thank you for your remarks. Uh, Ms. Weintraub, uh, I know that you personally and CFA and other organizations have been working on ATV safety forever. Uh, and I recall that I left the commission in 1984 and ATVs were high on our priorities. And when I came back, guess what? They're still high on our priorities and we're still working to promote safety. One of the big concerns that you personally have uh, pushed along with CFA is efforts to get st states to stop passing laws that permit ATVs on highways, especially paved roads. Uh, first of all, can you describe what the hazard is? And secondly, uh, are you as uh, concerned about the bleak future of what's happening with respect to this phenomenon as I am? Um, thank you for the question. And unfortunately, yes. Um, out of all the issues that I've worked on over the years, the issue of OHVs has been particularly challenging. And I'm not seeing that we're going in the right direction in terms of safety. Um, CFA has been working on ATVs, as you mentioned, for a very long time. And what we do is, you know, when we see something we evaluate it, we conduct analysis to see if our perception is actually true. And in terms of OHV on roads, we did a state-by-state -state analysis and found that, in fact, more and more states are allowing OHVs on roads either by um, passing legislation broadly or more more commonly, they're allowing jurisdictions the um, the ability to make those determinations on their own. And we have seen more and more states passing legislation. I believe we're up to 36 states that um, allow OHVs on roads or delegate that authority to an entity within the state. And um, our activities continue as robustly as we can. We um, work with partners. We identify through the media whenever we hear about uh, usually it's a local municipality. Sometimes these, these um, Ordinances are passed by entities that don't have websites, don't have emails. Um, so it's a real challenge for us. We're constantly trying to um, include people on the ground who are aware of what's going on in their communities and who are frankly um, more knowledgeable about the dynamics going on in those particular areas. We partner with the American Academy of Pediatrics and others. We're constantly looking for additional partnerships. And we send letters um, and then follow up on those letters, um, communicating the risk of operating OHVs on roads. OHVs are not designed for OHV use. It says so in manuals. It says so on the vehicle themselves. And unfortunately, it's created an incredibly complicated patchwork. Sometimes in states, there's different rules in different counties, but incredibly confusing for consumers who they can legally operate these OHVs on roads and yet it's recommended against their use. It minimizes the efficacy of the warning label. Um, so this is an area that we um, continue to prioritize for our organization and we would welcome additional support from industry as, as well as the agency who I know has um, supported this idea of, the, of opposing increased OHV use on roads. Uh, and also, Ms. Weintraub, you do make an observation that several other witnesses have made and will make about saferproducts.gov. Uh, I think that was uh, a major step forward. It's not as big a step as we need, which is to repeal this horrendous provision called Section 6B of, our, of the Consumer Product Safety Act. Um, but I was struck by this report that was done by uh, CFA and other groups called saferproducts.gov five years li live. And one of the uh, data points you cite is the number of complaints that have been received by two agencies, CFPB and CPSC, because we both set our databases up roughly the same time. They got 622,000 complaints, uh, and we've had, according to this time frame, and it's gone up a little bit, 29,000. Do you have any idea why the discrepancy between the number of complaints coming in to CPSC versus CFPB? Um. There's certainly some things we know, some things we don't know. Um, 
financial products tend to hit at the core of consumers' personal finances, um, and especially when they involve a lot of money, it could be devastating for consumers. Um, so I think there is one inherent difference between financial products and consumer products. However, the CFPB had prioritized communicating about this database. They did monthly reports. Um, sharing what information they had, trends they could see from this data, um, slicing and dicing the information in very useful ways for academics, consumers, the media. Um, so I think that has gone a very long way in terms of making their tool um, much more well known in the broader consumer and academic community. And I think, um, you know, I know when the CFPB database was created, they really did look to CPSCs because it was a few steps ahead in terms of how it was created. Um, and the CFPBs includes narratives, which are incredibly important, which CPSCs does as well. But I think um, we do have a lot to learn and we need to do a lot more. And, and with our report, we've been trying and we pretty much as a rule always mention um, the database when we communicate to the public um, in reports and press releases because we think it is so important that consumers consider saferproducts.gov to be an important um, safety tool just as they do with you know, a lock on a cabinet, that it's incredibly important to share information and use the database as a resource. Uh, thank you. I don't know if I can get this question in, but Ms. Gardner, uh, you cite all the groups that are supporting TB117. You left out one group that does not, and that's CPSC staff. And one of the points that staff makes is it's difficult to move from the mock-ups of furniture to large-scale real furniture, and that seems to be, in their view, one of the defects of the uh, of the safety standard. Do you have any comment at all about uh, TB117 that uh, would address staff's concern? To, Feel please free turn to your speaker. Yeah, I feel free to submit uh, comments. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I have to admit that this isn't um, the freshest in my mind right now, but I do recall two or so years ago, commission staff um, issued um, a briefing paper that explained why they they did not support TB117-2013 as a national standard. And I think um, you know, many groups pointed out that that, that, re that briefing paper had some serious errors in it. And uh, the, the folks at Bear Hefty, the agency in California that that implements, that adopted and implements the California standard, felt that it, it seriously misstated um, what was happening in California. And I believe that as a result of that, some conversations were instigated between CPSC staff and Bear Hefty staff. And I have to admit that I don't, I have lost track of, of where that um, ended up, and you may know. But I do think that the, that, um, the Bear Hefty staff really felt that the concern that CPSC staff flagged was not a, a genuine concern, and they're the ones who are actually implementing it. So I think it would be worth revisiting, uh, revisiting this question. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Adler. Commissioner Robinson. Uh, Ms. Gardner, I just want to follow up on what Commissioner Adler was saying because I certainly am one, and I think I, I won't speak for anybody else, but I, th but I was hoping that TB117 was the answer because it seemed like a pretty simple um, uh, answer if it was appropriate. But because our staff raised the objections that they did, um, I think my recollection is that it had to do with test method and that the supporting data required under our act wasn't there. But my recollection is exactly the same as yours, that we got to a point where there were conversations, and I don't know what happened after that. So I think revisiting this and bringing it up again is a great idea. Thank you. And I will, I will commit to checking in with, um, with Bear Hefty staff and, and seeing where we are and, and reporting to the commission and see if we can jumpstart this. Right. Thank again. you so Thank much. You. Um, and I just want to thank all the other panelists, too, for your presentations and for the efforts that you're making on behalf of consumer safety. Um, a number of witnesses have talked about these dangerously unstable dressers, millions and millions of them that are in our homes. And I just wanted to address this hidden hazard that exists in so many homes that's lurking there, um, Just and the, the statistics on the numbers of children that are killed and injured from these dressers is absolutely outrageous. And I agree with those who think that we should be doing more. 
Um, as I prepare to leave, I confess that one of my biggest disappointments is that I have not been able to do more. This has been a big focus um, for, of my office in trying to force industry to eliminate this hidden hazard. This should not be up to parents to find out about it and to anchor the furniture. It should be up to industry to make furniture that's stable and safe. And I fear that whatever progress we were making um, with a lot of effort from my office is now being undone. And we are not being aggressive about it, and I encourage you to continue to really, really press the CPSC um, to get aggressive about getting stable furniture. Um, and I, let me just start by saying I worked very hard on the Anchor It campaign, um, but I am absolutely convinced that that is not the solution for a number of reasons. Ms. Weintraub, you pointed out a number of those. Um, but you start with, this is such a hidden hazard. I mean, people just don't know about it, as Ms. McGee has told us, as somebody who's so educated, listens to the news, people just don't know about it. And even if they do know about it, there's so many reasons they can't do it, as you pointed out, that, that, um, that some people can't put holes in their walls, there are cement walls and so forth. And I would add to what you said that anchoring is not easy to do. You gotta find a stud. There are an awful lot of people in this room, if they were honest, don't know how to find a wall stud. Um, and you have to have, you also have to have tools that many people don't have. And I have to say, as somebody who's looked at our investigations, even when the, the furniture is anchored, it frequently will cause an injury or death because the child will step on the drawer and the anchor will pull out of the wall because it's either not pro properly put in or for whatever reason, or in some instances is pulled out of the back of the furniture. So it's simply not the answer. And I am quite appalled that that seems to be the only communication coming out of my agency right now is that anchor it, anchor it, anchor it. And I just don't think it's the answer. Um, and with respect to our recalls, I have to say that for many years, um, and I was appalled to find this out um, back in 2015, that for many years, all we required of the manufacturers of furniture was that they um, offer people free anchoring devices. And we didn't require refunds. We didn't require a large and effective communication strategy. We didn't require an offer to have a professional come in and anchor it if you wanted to keep the dresser. And no commitment by the manufacturer, interestingly enough, that going forward they would manufacture um, furniture that met some minimum standard. So my office put in a huge effort um, to try to change that. And I have to be honest with you, Ms. McGee, it was, the, it was your son's incredibly tragic death that was the turning point. We finally started focusing on we have to start getting industry to do more. I remember vividly the moment I heard about this tragic death. Um, our, so our compliance staff started doing what we should do. We started examining different manufacturers' dressers to see if they met stability standards, and if not, we were recalling the furniture, and we developed a template, which was terrific, of the requirements for those recalls. Um, and we weren't, we weren't willing at that point to say there are lots of old dressers out there and focus on, the, on, the, on just the, the anchor at campaign, but we were trying to get them out of people's homes. And we had the template, recall, full, full refund, we'll send a professional in, and going forward you have to uh, manufacture compliant dressers. But all of that, of that has changed in the last year. Um, and in the past year, we've seen that CPSC has retreated from this strong pro-safety approach of recalls of unstable furniture. I can tell you that a number of, of companies that I thought recalls were going through have simply disappeared from the report. Um, we've stopped the number of recalls being processed. Of those recalls we've done, we've gone back to the cheap anchoring kit without the requirements that we had in our previous template for manufacturers. Um, and it, it just, it, when you look at, and, and I have to say also that even the recalls that we did before the change of leadership, I'm very disappointed in the follow-up and the pushing we're doing with those companies to make sure they're doing all they can do to get those dressers out of people's homes. They're just, they, they, they know they don't have to because CPSC is not going to force them to, so they're not doing it. Um, so... I very, very, very strongly believe this onus should not be on the parents, that we've got to, we've got to make um, the, 
the furniture companies do something. And I'd like to say that as much as we have made some movement toward a mandatory standard, um, it became clear to me um, during my time as a commissioner in the last five years that the mandatory standard probably wasn't going to happen on my watch. And so we've really focused on trying to do something about the voluntary standard. And to say that it's been disheartening would be a gross understatement. Even with the welcome new leadership, Rick Rosati's been doing a great job um, from BV. Um, but there's such pushback from industry because it's more expensive to make dressers that are stable. Um, and our staff engineers concluded long ago that the standard now is not adequate. Um, it's very simply, you have to be able to pull out all the drawers and the dresser won't fall over or pull out each one individually and put a 50 pound weight on it. And boy, do they put that on gently, not the way that any child is going to step on the drawer of a dresser. And our staff has been pushing very, very hard for let's increase the weight because kids are bigger now. And let's, let's replicate real life situations where we've got clothes in the drawers and, and the weight goes on the way a child is really going to um, step on a drawer, but that ha that has just not happened. And I will just tell you one thing that really, really ripped me apart in terms of what industry is doing to play games with this standard. They have recently added out steps to drawers. Now, what the heck that is, I don't know. I mean, we all pull out drawers, we put our things in, take things out, and put it back. But they've added out steps from what I can see for the sole purpose of we will now test with the weight, with the drawer not pulled all the way out. So that's the kind of gaming of the system that we're seeing. And we also have, as we know from numerous reports from CPSC, thank you consumer reports, thank you kids in danger, and UL uh, um, also for doing these studies of what kind of compliance we have. And we just have really low compliance. We have really dangerous dressers out there. And I just have to, I admire CPSC staff. They've just been amazing about being patient and trying to get in industry to do something. But um, I just have to say in terms of the hope for the future, there are two things that I'd say. Someday we're going to have future leadership that's going to go back to trying to really make industry, make these dressers safer. But, would, uh, but we also have the Sturdy Act that's sitting there. I don't know if it's going to get through in this Congress. Maybe there will be a change in the Congress um, come November. But the Sturdy Act basically was Senators Casey, Klobuchar, and Blumenthal, and Representative Schakowsky um, supported an act that would basically lift the requirements on the CPSC for a mandatory standard that are in place now and make it more like a 104. So we should be able to, to pass that rule. So I'm, I, I still, I'm one of those always looking um, for a reason to be optimistic. And so I'm, I'm hoping that we're going to see some action on that. Um, I have 48 seconds left, so let me just say that I hope to address um, with the next panel the concerns that have been raised by many people about 6B, and I hope to do it in a way that's not as repetitive as all of us have been about n the onerous requirements by Congress, but then we've added to it by our regulations, and it's being interpreted in a way that's way too restrictive particularly when it comes to the consumer groups and the, the groups that you represent getting information out of the agency, which under the Freedom of Information Act you have every right to, and the idea that you should get reports that are heavily redacted information that is not proprietary is pretty outrageous. And so I will finish that up on the next panel. Thank you again so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Gardner, I'll start with you. I want to just follow up. My understanding of the conversations between the Bear Hefty staff and the CPSC staff is that, unfortunately, I don't think that they ended up in a agreement across the board on those technical issues and the challenges that we face. Just as you reported that the Bear Hefty folks looked at the CPSC report and found that it was technically lacking in some areas. It was the same with CPSC staff looking at the Bear Hefty work and finding that it was technically lacking in some areas. And we're in a tough spot because we're not fire scientists, as far as I'm aware. And so when a CPSC staffer says, I've been spending 17 years studying char lengths, and I can tell you, Bear Hefty did not apply the proper methodology. That's a very difficult thing to disregard. And that's the fire hazard, obviously, and we take the fire hazard seriously. And so I think all of us up here have wanted to find a resolution to that issue. But if there is, if there's some way that more technical discussions can occur, if there's some way that 
there's some way to break that tie, I think we're all open to it. Okay, um, I do think that it's also complicated by the fact that what we often don't talk about is the second half of what what California did was that they want to study large open right. flame and whether or not they need to make further changes. And so I'm not aware of why there's an urgency for the commission to lock in TB117 right now, because I think that California already, by its action, made the changes. You're saying 25% don't comply, and that's obviously an issue. And that may not change if CPSC made it a national standard, because it sounds like what's being sold in California, one-fourth is violative. That's a California issue. Well I'll but, speak to that. Yeah, in a but second. my but my larger point is that if we're going to go in the direction of adopting this, then California ends up modifying it based on its open flame study. I don't know how we've achieved anything. I think what we want to try to do, or at least I would like to see happen, is that these issues get put to bed for good, both on the fire hazard side and on the chemical exposure side. But if there's mm-hmm. anything else you want to add, please go ahead. Thank you. Yes, and I I really appreciate all four of your openness to trying to get to the bottom of this, and and which obviously we share. And and I think this is uh, encouraging me to go back to this and try to get see if we can get to the bottom of this. Um, but in terms of what violates or doesn't violate California standards, I think the key is that the flammability there's a the flammability standard, as far as I understand, is being, I don't, I have no evidence that people aren't complying with the smolder standard, but one can comply with the smolder standard and, in addition, add toxic flame retardants, even though those flame retardants aren't needed to comply with the standard. And I think that's why our petition, the organohalogen petition, is so important, because, because there's no, nothing that prohibits the use of, of, flame retardants. It's just that they're not required any longer under right. California law. And so that it sounds like that would not get addressed if CPSC adopted as a national standard TB117, the point that you just raised. That's right. And that's, that's why the our petition, of the petition. Yeah. is, is, so, is yeah. so critical. But if there were a national standard, it would mean that no other state could adopt for example, the old version sure. of the California standard that essentially mandated chemicals. Which I'm not aware anyone's actually stampeding to do that, are you? There are there were bills introduced this year in Hawaii and New Jersey at a minimum. Hmm. Um, I don't believe that they're moving, but there are always efforts that, you know, we believe are being pushed by the chemical industry at this at the Got state it. level. Okay, thank you for that. Ms. Cleary, I wanted to follow up on uh, the topic that Mr. Adler had raised, Commissioner Adler had raised. Uh, there is a precedent, obviously, at the commission in the last few years about trying to provide relief on GCCs in the event that there's no safety issue. And so I'm certainly willing to continue to explore that issue with you. I know you guys were in recently, and we didn't really talk about this topic, but certainly if you guys want to set up something with my office, happy to look at that. And I think that for us, we're going to want to just have you know absolute certainty that it wouldn't raise any safety concerns, that I think that as Commissioner Mohorovic had demonstrated and what he had done with GCCs, that he found an area where it truly was unnecessary. Everyone agreed across the board. And so if that can be a similar situation, we're certainly open to working with you on that. Thank you. The only other question I had, though, related to it is, do you have any sense as to what percentage of refrigerators in the United States are sold by AHAM members? Meaning, are there folks outside of the scope of AHAM membership that are selling refrigerators in the U.S.? There may be a few, but not many. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Denny, thank you again for coming back. I wanted to ask and express appreciation for the window blind cord work that AAP had done. I was curious to know why a study on that, like what led to that, and why is AAP working on that particular issue? So um, thank you for the question, Commissioner. Um, The AAP did not conduct the study. It was conducted by Dr. Gary Smith at um, the Center for Injury Research and Policy. I'm sure you're familiar with his injury work. Um, Why he chose that particular topic, I'm unclear. The reason why we, again, we I know we've just, we bring this up in our testimony each year. We bring it up is because it does continue to be an issue, and we want it to continue um, to be one of the priorities. You know, we did see that movement um, related to the the stock blinds, but do think that it should be applied across the board to all blinds. And thank you for that clarification right, that Gary had done the work and that AAP had just uh, published had, it. Exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, the reason I ask about it is that my good friend to my immediate left has accused me in the past 
of working on that issue, not for data-driven reasons, but for political or emotional reasons, is AAP, is this a political or emotional issue for AAP? Is that why AAP has taken it up? Or do you feel that there is a legitimate child safety data-driven reason for this to be a hazard addressed as a priority? Thanks for the question. The really great thing about being a pediatrician is it's not politics at all. It's all about the health and safety of kids. And we, I mean, all the issues that we bring to the table related to injury are just, are very data driven. Great. So you do feel that there's a solid data foundation for this issue to be a, a hazard priority for the commission. Correct. Great. Thank you for that. And Ms. Kern, I, I know that we've been overwhelming you with our questions, but I was... <laughs> Curious to know if you can give me a sense. I know that the staff had looked at some of the information that you had provided on the spandex testing. Has there been an ongoing dialogue? Because the last, of the, it's been a while, but the last that I heard from staff was, I think that they may have been, would have been able to benefit from additional data. Can you give me a sense of where that is, please? Certainly. So this is a priority for us and, and for our members in the industry, and so we just want to continue to flag that. Um, as far as where the process stands, um, the ball is in our court right now, so we do intend to follow up with you in the near future um, to, to continue that dialogue. Great, and obviously if my office can be helpful in any way, as I'm sure all the offices would, you know, please let us know, because it's certainly something that we're happy to stay interested in. Thank you. And then finally, Ms. Weintraub. Unfortunately, our exchange is standing between everybody and lunch, but I'll keep it brief. Uh, you've obviously been an observer of the commission for a long time and have seen the commission go through many different waves and different philosophies for addressing consumer safety. From your perspective, do you feel like the commission can achieve its mission effectively by categorically downplaying or ruling out using any of its tools? I think that the commission is the most effective and historically I think um, it, it's proven that the agency is the most effective when it uses all of its tools, um, obviously um, in combination depending on the specific circumstance, but the CPSC has numerous tools that Congress gave it and those tools um, make products safer for consumers, create an equal playing field for manufacturers who comply with the law, and make clear how incredibly important CPSC's laws are. And so do you, it sounds like what you're encouraging the commission to do is to make sure that we continue to robustly use all the tools that are available to us and not to predetermine that we're just not comfortable using certain tools and so therefore we're just not going to use them. Correct. I, I think it's very important for the agency to be legally driven and data driven looking at the particular circumstance whether a particular, usually there's a voluntary temporary fix first, whether that's working, looking at its statutory authority, what it's capable of doing legally, and if it is, um, you know, legally able to take particular action, which usually it is, then take action to more effectively eliminate if possible or mi minimize in some circumstances if elimination isn't possible, the particular hazard. Great. And the last topic that might circle back as well to Dr. Denny is uh, laundry packets, which the chairman raised. I think at the time of the publication of the standard, you and I may have been the two people who were most skeptical, hopeful, but skeptical that this was going to work. And it has been very disheartening to hear about how long it's taken to get to the point where people don't even agree on the proper methodology for data collection. So I was very grateful, Dr. Denny, for your answer to the chairman's question, for the chairman for asking that. But how do we move forward? I mean, it sounds like there's only a certain subset of, of legitimate methodolog methodological ways to address whether this is being effective, and you're suggesting it sounds like that some of the folks are offering suggestions for areas that are outside of that proper way of measuring it. How do we get past this and actually, because that was really supposed to be just the first step. That we weren't supposed to be bogged down this long in this question. So what do we need to do to move past this and make sure that we're doing the proper methodology? And does, because this started, sorry, if you can just know me for one more second, because this started as a chairman's effort by my predecessor, Chairman Tenenbaum, I think there's a precedent for a chairman's office at CPSC to continue to play a leadership role. Can the chairman get involved and step in and say, look, we need to get moving and pick legitimate methodological approaches and get this thing moving? Is there more that can be done? 
I would say yes, there is. And the role of the agency is entirely critical. I honestly think that um, the standard was as effective as it was because of the role that the CPSC played. Um, and I think that has to continue. I think one potential solution is, um, and this seems to be where we're going, is sort of agreeing to disagree about what the exact methodology is, putting all of the potential methodologies out there, both the public health preferred as well as um, what a number in industry have preferred, but really to get the data out there in um, the most transparent way possible and evaluate all data sets and, and move forward because it's incredibly important to make sure that, you know, ultimately we want the data to be decreasing. Ultimately, we want there to be fewer incidents. Of course, you know, even though we may have been skeptical, skeptical, ideally we want these incidents to be decreasing. So if this voluntary standard is working, hurrah, that's great. But if it isn't, we need to take stronger action. We need to figure out why it isn't, strengthen the standard, or perhaps um, push for a mandatory standard that builds on the voluntary standard. Great, thank you, thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, this concludes our second panel. Um, Ms. Weintraub, Ms. Kern, Dr. Denny, Ms. Clary, and, and Ms. Gartner, thank you all very much for your time and attention this morning. At this point, we are going to adjourn for one hour for lunch, and we will resume in one hour, and I look forward to seeing you all back here. Thank you all very much.